All right, welcome back, guys, to the Car Guys channel. I'm Ed Knight with Alan Lube, and you are going to be just blessed by his presence in today's episode number three of the TCG A to Z series with Bravo, one of the heroes that I have been greatly fond of ever since the start of the game. I've been playing him forever, and I believe Alan has also played Bravo basically since the start, but... Alan is going to give us a little bit of background on who they are, you know, kind of your background in the game, and uh, you are also a content creator, so you're going to give us a little bit of that. So uh, go ahead and fill us in, Alan. Who are you, and why are you the expert of Bravo? <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm Alan Lube. I am a, you know, casual content creator and, I guess, casual competitive fav player. Like, I'll travel to some events, but for the most part, I'm definitely not... Uh, on the levels of like you know the Hamiltons or Yuki or, or uh, you know all the all the other great players that are con consistently topping events and stuff. But uh, in terms of Bravo, I wouldn't really consider myself like the expert. Like I think even like obviously you have been playing Bravo to great success, and while we might have like some differing opinions sure. overall, it's pretty similar. And then also both of us, you know, when we started, we probably looked at Kale for guidance, right? He's like the Bravo expert. But um, definitely as time passes, like all of our styles change a little bit. And even though Bravo is still very much the same across the board, there are like slight differences uh, in terms of like personal preference and stuff. But yeah, I've been playing Bravo since I started playing. I didn't play when the game came out. I started when Monarch came out. And it just so happened that when I opened my first box of Welcome to Wraith, I pulled like two Crippling Crushes and I was like, oh, who's this guy? I'll play this guy. My and then uh, since then, I never really uh, dropped him except for like Starvo meta because he was actually unplayable during that meta. Right. Um, but yeah, with MST coming out, Bravo is definitely in a bit of a sticky situation, but we, we'll talk about that. Sure, sure. So uh, go ahead and tell us some of your notable accomplishments. I know you have top eight of many AGE Opens and whatnot, and you won plenty of ProQuest. Uh, I watch your channel personally, and uh, we're going to link his channel in the bottom. So let's go ahead and plug that. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of noble accomplishments, like I've won RTNs and ProQuest on Bravo in like, you know, varying metas. Like I've won or I've made the finals in like a ProQuest uh, during like the Icelander Oldham meta. I didn't think it was that bad, to be honest, um, even though everyone can agree Oldham was the better guardian. But, uh, you know, I played him during the Lexi meta. That one was a little bit better for him. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I won one like this year during the heavy hitters meta, I believe. Um, that one was tough, but for the most part, like people were still figuring out all the new heroes. So um, being like a specialist in a way gives you an advantage uh, a little bit, at least at the local scene. Um, in terms of like any higher up accomplishments, really the closest I ever got was um, 2023 U.S. Nationals. I was able to get ninth and that was during the Lexi meta. And that was really that was really heartbreaking getting ninth. But I'm still yeah. proud of uh, taking it there. It was just like that one little tiebreaker towards the end. Yep. Huge accomplishment. Okay. And then your YouTube channel is? Yeah. So my YouTube channel is Alan Lube, uh, Alan, A-L-A-N, Lube, L-U-B-E. And uh, I haven't been posting content recently because I've been on a bit of a break from the game. Um, and I think most people's expectation would be like, oh, it's because Guardian's not in a good spot or Bravo's in a really bad spot. Um, but really, it's just more like personal stuff, like trying to get, you know, my life uh, in order in terms of like work, personal life, friends, stuff outside of fab. But yeah. Sure. I still like look at the game every now and then. Like I'll watch some of the tournaments going on and see how things are going. But haven't really spent the time to really retool Guardians for like the new meta type or as much recently as I would have liked. Yeah, yeah. So I understand the light thing. Um, I had a baby recently. You know, I say recently. It's almost been a year at this point. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So uh, I understand how, you know, life kind of takes over here and there. And uh, honestly, with, with our boy not being as good as we like, this is probably a good time to kind of take a break and kind of reassess and whatnot. And, hey, he'll get better eventually, right? We, we just got to believe. Got to believe. <laughs> That's right. uh, possibly. It would, take, it would take something very big for him to get better. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. 
again, love your content. So you guys should check him out down. We have uh, the links in the description below where we, you can find Alan. Uh, so now, of course, you guys have been seeing this deck list on the screen. So we are going to introduce the style of deck we are going to be talking about here. Okay. So, um, Alan, you built this yourself. This is kind of adjusted to this new MST meta uh, to an extent. This is more of a traditional uh, style of Bravo, right? Something that I'm more mm -hmm. akin to play as well. One that I've always known and loved and played for a long time. So let's just go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so Bravo traditionally is you want, or his weapon, Anathos. It attacks mm -hmm. for six yep. if you have two cards with cost three or greater in your pitch zone. So a large majority of the cards in your deck cost three. And with the Guardian card pool, a lot of those are attack action blues. You have, you know, strong big red attacks like Crippling Crush. And for the most part, this, like Bravo, most of his cards block well. Like they'll block for three. He has a lot of armor. And really the game plan is to just disrupt your opponent through things like Crippling Crush, CNC, Pummel, those types of things. And um, yeah, this style of deck, I guess, is more akin to how I like to play it. Like even during like the Lexi times around... Um, you would see a lot of Bravo decks run Tunic, and that's perfectly fine too. Um, I have no opinion on which one is better. I'm just more used to this one. Sure. Um, and I guess maybe the other slight variation is running more of offensive auras, um, stuff like Earthlore Empowerment, which I don't have in this deck because I never really tinkered around too much with that. But that's another style you can go. Uh, for example, when Warriors were very popular, like Bolton or Kasai, and you don't want to be attacking with attack actions, if your deck has more auras, it's pretty mm. good. Um, but yeah, uh, that's kind of like, like you could consider Bravo mid-range. I know people don't love the term mid-range in Fab, right. but in a general sense, I consider a mid-range for the fact that um, his damage, his like pure offensive output, uh, is nowhere close to like other decks like Zen or Dash or things like that. And you can sort of like build him on the whole spectrum of like you can put in more stuff to make him his damage a little better or you can put in more stuff to make his like defensive game plan a little better. Um, some Bravo players will also go the full fatigue route where it's like instead of attack actions, you just got like nine staunch response. You got fate, you got sync, you got hard to find all, all that good stuff. Um, and so you can kind of uh, tailor him a bit to your liking. Um, but depending on the different meta you're in, one sort of style may favor uh, compared to another. Right. One way I kind of look at it and theorize about these decks, right? So like Zen, for example, you know, the new hotness yes. in the meta, uh, he is very much a exponential damage increase deck. The more cards he has in his hand, the more damage he will be able to present because they interact with each other. Uh, Guardians in general, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the time uh, is... Not that at all. It's a very linear damage output. The reason to play Guardian in general, especially Bravo, is because of those on hits. And Bravo gets very key uh, two specializations here, even three, if you um, want to look at Showtime as being able to get additional copies of uh, Crippling Crush and Starstruck and whatnot. So that's kind of the reason to kind of lean towards Bravo and what drew me to the hero in general is just being able to play this as if I'm... Uh, you know, able to control the game a little bit more. I've always been a control yeah. player uh, in the past playing Magic the Gathering or any other games along that uh, those lines, right? So I just kind of mm -hmm. like went to this because I like the idea of, you know, like discard two cards, you know, like, you know, if you set up a huge turn play to be able to have like a pivot turn with this and you know that you're going to have some additional uh, follow-up turns that maybe is a Starstruck or a Terra Sunder, which is very good with Anathos and the reason to play this card. Um, yeah, yeah, there's just a lot to like about the hero. Um, mm. And yeah, we'll, we'll kind of talk about real quick too is why we would play this hero over others. Uh, kind of in this meta, it... Can you think of a reason why to play this hero over others? So you can be honest. Realistically, at the moment, and even in heavy hitters, like if I'm not filled with copium, Bravo copium, there is really no reason to play Bravo over Victor. Um, I know. And so in sad. general, there's not that much reason to play Guardian as a whole right now. Um, just because the three new heroes are all high representation in the meta and you all struggle with them in a different way, and that sort of stretches your deck out to try to cover for all three, and you realistically can't. So um, I can just talk about them one by one. Like Zen, for example, yep. 
in general against the exponential aggressive decks um bravo can be pretty good because your crush attacks your disruptive attacks force them to block and interact with you the issue comes and it's still true like i wouldn't think zen is like an awful matchup or anything but um it's definitely scary if because zen is has seven armor basically and that can stop almost everything in your deck except for pummel and crippling and so because of that even if they just have one turn to hit you with their full like six card hand that's like enough to kill you a lot of the times or even if it doesn't kill you you're low enough where you need to give cards um and if you give too many right. cards then you can't play your really big disruptive attacks which is what you kind of need to do like every turn after turn yeah. uh, in terms of enigma it's an issue of not dealing enough damage because bravo gains value from his disruptive text and if those disruptive effects aren't hitting because enigma has ward she has dereacts she's like a very defensive illusionist in general, or can be a very defensive illusionist, then Bravo loses a lot of value there. And then against Nude, they steal your blue attack actions. So then, um, or there's she steals your blue steal. attack actions. Yeah, there's a lot to steal. If they get Terra Sunder plus any blue guardian attack and they just play it for free, then you're like, well, this is really tough. Um, so because of that, uh, Bravo in the traditional sense is kind of dead in the current meta, but you can sort of probably, you know, flip the deck on its head a bit and like play either extremely aggressive where you're playing less disruptive stuff and more just like pure damage value like you just need to find the balance between enough disruption for zen and enough damage so you can like also beat like a new enigma kano for example right, right? and that's yep. really tough to do with guardian because you don't have good sources of go again like you you have the zealous and the rouse but that's realistically not enough and they're not on all the time it's not always consistent and then so if you're running stuff like lead the charge it gets more clunky as well and then on the opposite end of the spectrum if you um want to go the fatigue route right where you still have the disruptive attacks for zen but against new if you change all your blue attack actions to like defense reactions and auras then they don't really get value off of that um you can beat the rangers pretty easily and you can um target any other deck that's trying to be extremely aggressive to ca or to to have like a flippy matchup against zen whether that's bolton whether that's dash whether that's dio um but the issue with that strategy is you auto lose to kano and enigma basically right, right. so it's like you can you can take it either way but you're gonna have bad matchups regardless and in the past bravo kind of shined as like a generalist maybe he's like anywhere from like the 40 to 60 range in most matchups whereas now it's like you're definitely going to run into some auto loses no matter what yep. you play for the, realistically yep. yeah back in the meta where i i guess just in the past in general not like any specific meta but when it was more like a 40 60 style game right it was a yeah. lot easier to justify being able to play bravo but when you do have you know multiple auto loss matchups it is a little bit hard that being said uh i don't want to discount him entirely i think there are ways that he can be built that make him very very viable in a uh, very tailored meta he's kind of like mm -hmm. the answer to a solved meta in a way right so if you know like what the three top decks are going to be and you know how to target those i think he is a very good pick if you can tailor that deck and do your proper testing to be able to make sure that you beat those the other thing too is with this style of deck that we're looking at here this is kind of like the catch-all right the mid-range you know like mm -hmm. you have game into almost everything is the idea that i see from this yeah. um I, you were saying that the damage is somewhat middling right against enigma yeah. but you have cards like pulverize which this is one of my favorite combos ever right you <laughs> yeah. make a uh, surge on turn one tech blading right and then you mm -hmm. show time you go get pulverize and then you heave the pulverize so heave text three uh pay three get three seismic surge now you're at four seismic surges right so that four makes it to where this costs six and that is a three card including itself uh 14 which is just like ginormous damage which is actually yep. crazy uh especially if you draw something like a uh, enlightened strike plus this like there's a lot of ways for you to like force that board out of the way so again not to discount this hero entirely it's just it's a little swingy but so is flesh and blood at this time in general yeah. anyway right so mm -hmm. okay so uh what does a favorable meta look like for bravo if you could see him being like a tier what would that look like yeah so i guess it can it can vary because for example 
let's talk about like the tradition or not traditional, but like a more aggressive disruption slanted Bravo, right? Mm -hmm. For that st or this style of deck, basically, for this style of deck to be good, there needs to be like for one a large or a large majority of the top meta decks need to be the sort of like Zen Azalea style decks where they want to keep a lot of their cards. They don't necessarily block very well, so your disruption is very taxing on them. And you know, even Riptide, uh, for example, like fatigue is is also a thing. Fatigue isn't as prevalent right now because, um, like Zen can go over the top sometimes crazily. Enigma and Kano are a thing, but if, for example, the top decks were Rangers or they were, uh, I'm trying to think of another deck that can be fatigued. Maybe like Vincent, right? Those style of decks can favor Guardian very well. And then on the other hand, for a defensive fatigue style Guardian deck to be good, um, you kind of need it's 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 more of the same the top decks need to be decks that you can fatigue but it's also um sort of the decks that are coming up for example to maybe counteract zen are other aggressive decks who don't lean into like tech to sort of avoid being fatigued like if we look at dash for example right like they're starting to cut like more of their pistol package because right. realistic guardian's not a huge part of the meta so because of that maybe then the meta shifts again to where guardian plays more fatigue style so they can uh counteract those decks as well but Bravo specifically um, struggles to sort of be the meta himself. Like, there's never a world where Bravo is, like, the focal point of the meta. He's always, like, uh, you try to answer specific parts of the meta with Bravo, uh, whether that's through the disruption, whether that's through Guardian Hammer fatigue gameplay, or mm -hmm. whether that's through, like, consistency, right? Because another reason why people love Guardian is consistency. Like, for the most part, if you you generally don't blow people out of the water. Like, sometimes you'll just chain Crippling Starstruck Spinal back to back to back to back, and you'll win a game versus, like, Akatsu yeah. or Zen because they just didn't get to play the game. But Bravo that's... Is the best deck when that happens. Yeah. Best yeah. It's, he's, it's fairly rare when that happens, and right. for the most part, only certain decks are susceptible to that style because, for example, if you play into KO, he can, like, stop, like, two of your big attacks with his fridge at any moment when he wants to and then hit you with mm -hmm. a Blood Rush for 25. And so, Yeah. Uh, Illusionist and Wizard are always going to be a prob problem for Guardian because just in general, the deck doesn't play super well with more cards all the time. Um, like, you can definitely have the sideboard options to have, like, go again, more damage stuff. But in the general sense, like, if Kano's just doing the stack game plan, and some stack, some play Kindle, but if they're trying to just defend and reach their pitch stack to blow you up, there's not really too much you can do about it unless you like really hit hard with like CNC pummels, you rouse zealous. And then the same can go for Enigma. She'll block you out really good. If you're playing the fatigue style game plan, then you basically have no shot into Enigma because you need to actually hit her. Um, same goes for Prism. Um, Prism is a bit more finicky because like there's the whole Popper and Heralds thing. Um, but yeah, Illusionist and Wizard is always going to be tough. I think even Runeblade is tough. No one's really been talking about Runeblade recently. But with Rosetta coming up, if Runeblade's another aspect of the meta, um, pitching a blue or the split damage is, is a big a struggle for Guardian in general mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you want to like block a few, attack with a few um, as like a mid rangey deck. But if you're pitching a card to you know block two arcane or even one arcane, then you're losing efficiency there. So then maybe you know you go back to the fatigue style where you're running like Rams of the Ramparts, so you can actually block and pitch. It, it's it's a lot of different aspects, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. Um, okay, so let's move over to the deck tech here. So mm -hmm. we have your deck that you were so graciously able to send <laughs> us and going to look at, right? So uh, traditional kind of tech plating Anathos, you know, the bread and butter or this hero. Let's talk about this hero <laughs> real quick. We kind of glossed over his hero text. Uh, yeah. In general, people think that it's fake hero text anyway because a lot of times you don't even use it until you're at a specific portion of the game. Um for me, it's when you know that they're out of armor and that you know these on hits are going to happen and you can continue to chain disruption, right? So if you're playing yeah. a mid-range and you've gotten out your like defense reactions and your air, right? And you gotten the air out of your deck and you can continue to make that. This hero power is actually very, very strong. Just giving dominate to these huge attacks and guaranteeing that you're leaking a significant amount of damage while also disrupting your opponent's hand is huge. This is actually mm -hmm. just like take an extra turn, the card right here against a lot of decks as well. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, once this card came out, I was so excited. I was so excited when this card Same. came out. I played <laughs> the crap out of this. Um, I did pretty well at a battle hard and, um, when this card came out, it was like heavy hitters. A little bit after that, obviously. Um, 
But I, yeah, I definitely took this card to some success here. So big fan of that. But yeah, so we have this uh, 47 card main deck. Um, so in general, like you don't really take any of these cards out because it's the main deck, right? Um, maybe here and yep. there I could see maybe taking out Hold the Line or something, but yeah. I'll let you kind of explain that. Yeah, so in general, when I play Bravo at least, I generally build the deck where the blues always stay in. However, this meta has become more swingy. So there's a world where, like if I was updating this deck, maybe I cut a few blues, maybe I go down to like 36 or even 35, who knows, right? Because um, the, another issue with Bravo compared to the other Guardians, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but for example, like back then I would play 40, right? And that's because I really right. enjoyed the consistency aspect. But in a more swingy meta, sometimes, you know, drawing a four blue hand just loses you the game right there. So you yep. need to like maybe cut down a little bit. Um, but yeah, as for the blues, like hold the line is more for like KO because that's a tough matchup. Also, he's high mm -hmm. represented and it helps um, just get some value in that matchup. But um, if you want to be more aggressive, then you can definitely cut down on the blues, add more reds. Um, the sideboard, you can add more offensive threats as well. If you feel like, you know, if you want to go down to like 35 blues, totally fine too. The main sure. issue is that compared to the other Guardians, Bravo has Starstruck and Crippling, which cost seven, and Victor, and I guess Betsy, but generally they don't have anything that costs more than six. Like you, they might play Thunderquake, but for the most part, it's like Spinal or Disable or anything lower than that, right? Yeah, there's you know, nothing. Yeah, there's nothing seven or higher that I can think of. Like some of them play Pulverize, well, but most. Pulverize, but yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like maybe that, right? But like most of the time, your cap for those decks, because you know. People have known I've been playing a lot of Victor lately and playing a few tournaments with that. So, um, yeah, the the highest cost card in the deck is Spinal. <laughs> it is what it yeah. is, right? So, And so, yeah, because of that, and also with Bravo's, you know, Dominate text costing two resources, that's also something you want to lean into sometimes. Like, even mm -hmm. against KO, even though they have a ton of armor, sometimes dominating something and just forcing them to give that armor so that you can hit something later is very important. So in general, Bravo, I feel like, requires more blues compared to the other two. And that's another advantage the other two Guardians have at the moment. Well, maybe not Betsy so much. No one really talks about Betsy. But sure, uh, for Victor sure. at the moment, because he can run 30 blues, and it's still consistent, fine. He can draw with Test of Strength sometimes. But as for Bravo, mm -hmm. if you cut down on the blues, you start feeling the a bit more of the awkward hands, especially when it comes to like Crippling and Starstruck. Exactly. It helps because Starstruck's a yellow, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's all fair. Um, so while we're looking here, so we have our signature weapon, right? We have Anathos. Mm -hmm. So um, for the people who might be getting into the game and kind of want to, you know, play really fun, good fundamentals like a learning hero, I think Bravo is <laughs> one of the best ones here. And uh, Anathos, to me, is the best weapon in the game. I love this weapon. <laughs> it's amazing. And it's honestly really, really efficient, right? It's a one card mm -hmm. four. Which, uh, you know, if you kind of subscribe to the Fab Math University and whatnot, right? It's a, a zero for four is kind of the baseline for a card, right? Um, yeah. So, like an attack action. So, one card four is what you want to be doing that is on rate in like a competitive sense. So, that's what this does. But when you pair that with your go again cards, right? Your. Um, your Zealous Beltings and your Rousey Ancients. We'll talk about the synergies between those as well. Uh, this becomes a six because when you have a second card that costs three or greater, which we talked about, you know, the majority of, if not everything in this deck, almost everything, uh, is a three cost or greater. This is going to pump this up anytime you have two cards in your pitch to a six, right? And the mm -hmm. other way to kind of use that as a synergy is with your tech plating, right? So... Uh, in like your slower mid rangey matchups, you know, maybe a Guardian Mirror of olden days, right? You'd be, yeah. you know, pitch, make a surge, attack for, with hammer, you block two cards, pitch, make a surge, attack with hammer, you pitch a crippling crush and a blue, next turn you pitch a blue and a blue, next turn you pitch a crippling crush and a blue, and so on and so forth, right? You get to practice those like really key fundamentals, which I believe made myself a lot better player by, you know, picking Bravo specifically and not picking some, you know, like, oh, just play out my hand every turn the deck, right? Um, what are your opinions on that? Yeah, I would agree. I think Anathos is probably, like, the most baseline card in the game, in a sense. Because you have the four with one card, which is, like, if you're blocking with three cards and attacking for four, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, if you're blocking with two cards and you're attacking for six, that's also pretty good. That's, like, three for every card, basically. 
And then if you're making a surge, maybe that can help set up for later. So you have like a little bit more value later on. Right. Right. Um, But I think, yeah, as we said, like with the meta being more swingy now, it's like, it's, it's tough for Anathos to really shine. Like you have the zealous and you have the rouse and that becomes amazing because zealous is five go again and your hammer turns into six. So that's 11 with three cards. It's one of the best rate things in the deck. Plus a surge. Um, Plus a surge. Exactly. Um, Or if you have tunic, you can even pummel the zealous, right? Um, Exactly. So that's also a great play but i think the main issue right now is that like the whole like block a few attack isn't really it's not trending right now it's either you're you're really attacking and you're only blocking with like extra cards you don't need because you mm-hmm. want to disrupt them or you're blocking with everything <laughs> right so it's it's a bit of a sticky situation like um but yeah anathos is still just extremely consistent like sometimes you're, you're just forced to take that turn off where you know you need a block with three cards maybe they send like uh, a CNC or something, and you need to block mm-hmm. that. Maybe they have another thing that you need to block, and you just swing four. And that four just adds up over time, even though you're playing against like a more aggressive deck. Um, like sometimes those fours add up, and then you draw into your good disruption. And they lost a few life early, and now they're getting low, and you can close out the game with dominate. Yep. It's uh, it's better than you expect. And even the turns when you're attacking for six, that's arguably like the worst turns because it's six and you're most likely blocking six. So that's only 12 value across your four cards, yep. which generally, you, you know, you're trying to reach like the 14 um, point threshold per hand, if possible. Um, and that's something Bravo doesn't really do very well. Uh, it's very conditional. Like if this spinal hits, I get like imaginary value basically, yeah. right? Because right. they get to do less. Uh, the same thing for crippling. Um, same thing for CNC and pummel. Um, but yeah, I think it's just very, it's very fundamental and it's very consistent. Like, if you're playing another deck where sometimes your hand just does nothing, or if like you're playing Vincent and you draw four non-attacks, or even if you're playing, I don't know, Enigma and you just draw all D-Reacts and you didn't set up yet, then it's a little awkward. Whereas Bravo, pretty much every hand can do something. Um, the issue is that if you have too many cards, sometimes you can't make use of all of them. And if you have too little cards, you're you're consistent, but you're not really like pushing to get yourself back into the game. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. So... Uh, moving on, we'll talk about these kind of are more generic. Like, obviously, this was just kind of a, a blocking upgrade to uh, yeah. Crater Fist. Crater Fist obviously has its place. I still love Crater Fist. Um, I'm biased because mm-hmm. I have a gold foil. But mm-hmm. I still love it because, you know, being able to say uh, you have Choke Slam or something and you had a Surge and then you could crack Crater Fist because you have the extra blue and then you come in for 10. Like, that's a big deal, right? Uh, this card, just in general, especially in this kind of, like, aggressive meta, can matter a lot, especially against, like, um, News, for instance, right? Like, um, <laughs> I say News uh, as if we're talking about BBC or something like that. But uh, uh, New the Hero, right? So yeah. they have so many different attack reacts and being able to cover up in a way that uh, makes it to where you can kind of play around things is is huge. Uh, the other thing too is like even in the mirror, I found that this card has been exceptionally strong because if you know yeah. that they're going to have a pummel turn, it's very telegraphed in Guardian Mirrors generally when they're about to pummel you, right? Because they took a bunch of damage and then they send like a CNC and they have two cards left. You're just like, okay. I see. Mm-hmm. I see what's happening yep. here. Being able to cover this up um, with, you know, a couple of cards and then this, and you know you can take a little bit less damage and get rid of a couple of cards. Depending on the situation, uh, this card is it's really good. I've really enjoyed this. Um, any any thoughts, any additions that you'd like to add for that? Yeah, I would say that's. Mo- I mostly agree with everything. I think just the fact that it blocks three is already a good baseline. Sure. Sure. Um, but MST printed the uh, the gauntlet that is like very anti Zed, and like that being a generic that many other decks can run, and is arguably you know even better. Um, like I still wouldn't run the new gauntlet, um, the MST one that gives minus one to all your opponent's right. attacks. I think it's called pain. Stonewall Gauntlet or something. Stonewall, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't really play that in Guardian just because this covers like every matchup where that's more Zen specific. Like maybe if you really want to meta game and you're confident you're just gonna play Zen Zen Zen, then you can try the other one because like if they start with descendant and you know they're going to bonds you that might get you like four or five value whereas this is mostly three and zen doesn't really do on hits it's just pure damage um but just overall guardian just has the good equipment and right. uh yeah i agree with most of what you said crater fist has a it has its uses uh i just find myself preferring this one um because my mind doesn't process crater fist that often when i'm playing so sure. i just, just like i'll yeah. just get the one value in the matchups where it matters yeah 
Yeah, a lot of people even forget that Critter Pissed has text. <laughs> I've used it yeah. a lot more than uh, people give me credit for. It. But uh, especially in the five meta where you had Crush the Weeks, I'd slap uh, Crater Fist onto Crush the Week super, super often. Mm -hmm. But uh, Crown of Providence, um, you know, most people know this card. This card that allows you to kind of filter your hand if you're getting uh, CNC'd yourself, right? You can go ahead and get rid of that and kind of take it to where instead of losing one card or uh, two cards, sorry, then you're losing the one uh, off of like a pummel play, right? So that mm -hmm. that's mainly what I see, at least in the mirror. And then if it is a, like a leave no witnesses, for example, as well as a good option, um, you, mm -hmm. you block that card with this. Uh, most of the time, they're not going to banish like a red on top of your deck. So the silver generation doesn't really matter or anything like that. And honestly, the biggest deal about this card is the hand fixing because Bravo is one where they need to have um, like three blues plus the red card. If you draw the um, the offhand where it's like, I really needed to keep this tempo, this card saves you. It will actually just bail you out, right? Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think when heavy hitters came out, a lot of people just went to balance only and that's perfectly fine too. Like if you're really mm -hmm. short on space, like a lot of people are cutting Crown of Providence for balance because... You know, it targets a lot of the big matchups, like against KO, they'll Blood Rush, you draw a card. Against Zen, the Art of War, you draw a card. Right. Um, but just, I think for Bravo, he really needs to, like, keep hitting your disruptive stuff on your opponent. So that's why I enjoy Crown of Providence. And it yep. also means if I'm running more blues and I draw, like, a bad blue hand, even if I Arsenal blue, later on I can cash that in for a fresh draw exactly. if they hit me. But it, yeah. yeah, it adds consistency is the big thing, like... Uh, again, yeah. you said Guardian is all about consistency. It's more consistency, right? And then yep. the newest card, I believe the newest card, maybe not so much. This might be the newest card. But anyway, the yeah, the more yeah. like popular newer card that people like to talk about and is honestly kind of hard to play is Civic Steps. Uh, so another yeah. three health, being able to uh, cover up breakpoints and whatnot here and there. But it has a negative of giving your opponent a quicken token. So... Uh, if you can, let's talk about some of the situations where you would actively want to try to get the value out of this and make it to where your opponent can't utilize the Quicken token. And some mm -hmm. maybe some uh, positions that you want to avoid, like, for example, Mechanologist. Right. Yeah, so the two main situations where you want to cash in Civic Steps are when you want to stop an on-hit to present something back. For example, like if you give them a quicken, but you're doing that to stop a CNC and you have spinal on your turn, if they eat right. the spinal, they can't use the quicken. If they block the spinal, they probably can't utilize the quicken to like its max right. uh, value with their hand. Um, there is the in that situation, there is the chance where they just full block and pass and keep the quicken. But in general, that's like mostly okay because that means you get another turn to hopefully present another right. good disruption hit, right? right? And the other situation is when if you have a good understanding of your opponent's deck and you know they're on the second to last attack of their turn is when you cash in civic steps just for the health and then when they play their last attack they eat up the quicken but they can't attack again mm -hmm. so i guess a good example would be uh maybe even dash right like it's a little dash is a little tough because they can order things in a way to sort of like trip you up a bit but if it's very clear that you know they got no cards left and they're going to pistol induction pistol then you can just you know uh, slap the civic on the first pistol and if they don't induction, maybe they had like extra resources that they didn't utilize. So that's an example. Another example would be against Ninja. In general, most of their stuff right. has go again anyways. So just cashing that block in um, is mostly fine. There might be some like niche situations where you accidentally give like, I don't know, 100 wins go again or something. But for the most part, it's mainly safe. And you can kind of save it for like whenever you feel necessary. Yeah. Like they might throw a CNC out of nowhere or something. Um, against KO, yeah. I find Civic Steps is extremely hard to use but this was back then when they were running um cast bones because even if you know their their last attack is coming if their last card is a cast bones and they slap that on you after you know you give them civics and stuff then it's like it's awful and also if they if they have if you try to count their resources to see like they're gonna go two cost attack uh claw into two cost attack maybe they have tunic up and it's actually a what's the one that draws savage feast Yes, yes. Yes. If they play that, they draw a new card, it has go again, then you're like, oh my goodness, punished yeah, so hard, right? There's there's some uh, pretty bad situations that can arise. Like yeah. um, 
Zen lately has started playing E Strike again because of the the bonds oh, band. So yes. they're doing that. So there have been some situations where it's just like, okay, um, I feel pretty safe using Civet Steps. I use it, and then they're just like E Strike draw a card, and I'm like, okay, yep. you got me. So you got to be careful yeah. with it. Um, that that was a funny game. It was like literally back to back E Strike for like two turns, and I was like, okay, well they they had two e strikes last turn and the next turn they won't have another e strike it's turn three and they have another e strike i was like oh, whatever so yeah. there are some uh situations where this card can be detrimental to you but a lot of times if you are disciplined and you kind of read what's going on you kind of keep track of what your opponent has played you know just like you know doing the the normal fad things um, yeah. You can get a lot of value out of this as if it's just the extra health. The Quicken token literally doesn't matter a lot of times. And another thing I like to do with this is sometimes you can block knowing that it's bait, like what you were talking about in your first example. And they're just like, oh, okay, I'm just going to keep my card. I'm going to arsenal my card. And then you're just like, oh, cool, spinal, pummel it. And then they're just like, what are you yep. going to do? Yeah. Yeah, it's sweet. So uh, good card. People still complain about us not having Guardian Boots, but honestly, I think it's still pretty good. Like, this is solid. I, I can't complain too much. I mean, I would love something better, obviously, but... I think I think people complain mainly because when you compare to, like, the other mid-range-esque decks of Brute and Warrior, their boot options are crazy. I, and don't you're, have you're correct. Potential massive you downside. Correct. Um, but, you know, if anything, Civic Steps just lets you uh, flex your knowledge, right? And exactly. if you make a mistake, well, then that's a learning experience on you. But sometimes you do have to understand that um, you can't read everything your opponent has. And if right. sometimes you're punished, that's just that's just how it is. Um, yeah. Another thing I like is that the fact that your fridge is eight sometimes against Brute, if they swing big me early, I will literally give all eight and just like get the quick in so I can Anathos. It's a little awkward because they have the Scowling Flesh Bag, but you can also you know, try some things to like bait them with that too. Sure, but sure. Um, once it's gone, then you can try to make use of that quicken token. But yeah, Brute, Brute is just so annoying because they have flesh bag. They have yeah. just as good armor as you. They do more damage than you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a they tough one. You know, they don't cool have disruption. They don't have cool looking they don't cards. Have disruption. But that's an opinion. So it's that's subjective. Yeah. <laughs> that's subjective. Okay. But yeah. Um, so let's talk about the sideboard here. So we talked about uh, the equipment. We talked about the main board. This is pretty stock. Um, I'll just kind of glance over some of these cards. Of course, Command and Conquer is kind of a staple now. You make a surge. Mm -hmm. You play Command and Conquer off of two cards. Great tempo play. You kind of bank that surge for next turn to make it to where you can go dominate into a Spinal Crush. Or go three-card Crippling because it costs six now, right? So um, mm -hmm. in general, in this like more aggressive meta, People don't want to give up the cards anyway, so using the dominate isn't like a huge deal. So just sending, you know, three card crippling is enough a lot of times. Same thing with Starstruck. Uh, three card Starstruck gets most people's hands. Um, then your stock blues, you know, you're playing every single popper I see here, plus uh, Showtime and Imposing Visage. Uh, there's a lot of cool things that you can do with Showtime. This does use your action point, though. A lot of people forget that. Um, when you play this, if it's mid-game and you play this, go get an attack. You are not swinging Anathos. You are passing go and not collecting $200. You're going straight to jail. Pass your turn, arsenal your card. You're done, right? But your mm -hmm. next turn is going to be great. So, yeah. You know, it's kind of give and take. Um, but the reason that we're playing Showtime is because you can kind of get some advantage off of the, like, obviously your turn one play. Uh, but with Imposing Visage mid-game, it's so good. It's so good. Especially if you have, like, your four-card <laughs> blue hand. This is ways to make it to where those four-card blue hands aren't actually just trash, right? So you can go get your critical card, attack for six anyway, and then your follow-up turn, you draw another card, so you got to block a little bit, and you just keep laying on the pressure. Like I, And the art's amazing. Again, it's just better <laughs> than brew art, right? So good stuff. And then you got Big Buff Man. The, you know, th this is uh, James White's mistake, as mistake he calls it. Card. Yeah, that and then Thunderquake. I love Maybe at the card. time. Yeah. Maybe now it's not as much of a mistake. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Terra Sunder. This is also a staple, especially with your Anathos, because Anathos becomes a six. So you pitch a blue, play Terra Sunder. You pitch another blue, attack for seven, because this gives plus one. It gives your hammer <laughs> dominate. And if it hits, they discard two cards, not crushes, if it hits. And that yeah. is also huge. So since they gave us these like extra cards, 
that can kind of help in the blue slot, it has increased the uh, consistency of Bravo in general, right? So yeah. more reasons to kind of play Bravo over something like Victor. Victor doesn't play Terra Sunder. He just doesn't because like mm -hmm. you can't afford the misses in your deck. Uh, Betsy probably does, but again, it's Betsy. So we'll move on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so down to the sideboard. So this is kind of... Um, in a way, I see some like more generalized style cards, and I see some numbers that may or may not be more traditional. I've played around mm -hmm. with a lot of different numbers, but why don't you tell us um, kind of where each of these cards fit in the meta and kind of what you're playing these cards into specifically, kind of like your game plans by playing things like Chokeslam, Enlightened Strike, Pulverize, Pummel, so on and so forth. Yeah, so I would say like the first category of card are the two damage efficient cards which would be e-strike and zealous these are for matchups where you just want to push raw numbers and you don't care about disruption as much so against kano against illusionist um against the old pistol dash uh right. dashes nowadays are a little different but yeah so th these two cards were extremely important and it took a while for e-strike to kind of be like a mainstay in guardian i would say like there was a, lo a long period of time where like it wasn't really popular people didn't like it that much um, cause it's still, even it doesn't make your Anathos six because you're bottoming a card instead of pitching. Right. Right. But, um, I think a lot of people have just come around to the fact that guardian just doesn't have better options. And if you combine <laughs> the two, then the value is there. Like you can go zealous into E strike into hammer for six, which is a full five card hand, but sometimes right. you need that to just push the damage. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, this is a great arsenal would, target. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other card that sort of plays with E strike. Not so maybe, for I example, like if you're playing against something like Enigma, right, and mm -hmm. you're doing your Zealous Belt and your Enlightened Strike, you want to be playing something like Pulverize as well. So this is kind of like your push your big mm -hmm. number, right? Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, Pulverize is also a very damage efficient card. I also like it because it pairs with your two cost attacks very well, like CNC. Mm -hmm. If you want to play Weakest Link for um, the MST heroes, you can definitely do that as well. Because if you go make a surge, weakest link slash CNC, and you have two cards in hand, they're like, oh, I'm getting pummeled. Let me block six, and I have a D-React maybe for the weakest link. CNC, they can't D-React, so they might just eat it. But right. um, And then you're like, okay, no pummel. I heave my pulverize. Next turn, I'm going to hit you for 14. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and you made them commit cards. And so most likely, you can block whatever they're going to do next. Um, the worst situation is if like they're able to explode on you even after... Um, the CNC slash weakest link play, which generally doesn't happen. But yeah, it does have to line up. Pulverize is also, in general, a very clunky card. If you arsenal it at any point in the game, um, you have to commit to like a full hand to play it out. And a lot of times just saying, yeah, just hit me is not a great idea in the current meta. But... <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it just depends on the state of the game. It's very situational. There are times where I do arsenal this without heaving it, right? Um, yes, yeah. It depends on the matchup, but... Um... Yeah, in general, it can get stuck. It is a little difficult. You do have Crown of Providence, so you do get a freebie um, yeah. in, in certain situations. But the, the main reason I like this card is because it's synergy with Showtime. And you can set yes. that up turn one. So when you have this in your main deck, like when you're playing against the Guardian Mirror, for instance, um, you have three here, three here, and then two Pulverize. You can kind of count these cards as additional copies of Pulverize. And if you get to heave this turn one in like a mirror, you feel very ahead. Right. I, yeah. I say very. I'd say like in a true mirror, like a Bravo mirror, you feel, I, I'd say even like 10% ahead than you yeah. would generally. Um, that would be a normal 50 50. So it immediately goes to like a 60 40 if you mm -hmm. are on the exact same like 60 or, you know, however many cards you're playing into the mirror. Yeah. So I, I would, I would, yeah, that first category is like the damage of uh, efficient cards. And also with Pulverize, sometimes you can like kind of cheese an endgame situation. Like maybe they're at eight and you're playing against a KO. They don't have any armor left and you're just waiting for a turn to like eat whatever they do. And you're like, please don't kill me. And this Pulverize will end the game. So right. it's in a situation where Bravo's Dominate does matter. But a lot of the times it can also bait you into trying to end the game and you're never able to because um, they keep stripping cards from you because you need a block or something. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I would say Pummel is also another, well, let's go to the next category, which is just like more disruptive effects. So that would sure. be like Spinal, Pummel, Chokeslam. Uh, Chokeslam is great against the ninjas. It's great against Ranger, you know, all these decks that want to like Art of War or buff their attacks uh, like Azalea does. Um, playing this is like great because 
they either need to give a card plus two armor, or in Azalea's case, she doesn't have much armor. She gives two cards. If they run perch a lot of the times, but some decks also just run snap, right? Right. Um, because they're not respecting the guardian, which I don't think they really should. Um, to a degree, also, okay. like sometimes respecting the guardian deck just it doesn't make you win more. It just like makes it feel a little closer. Um, but sometimes just hitting them really hard on their one off turn is like the best strategy sometimes. But yeah, so choke slam spinal great against any deck that wants you know to use go again, which is a large majority of decks. Um, even in the yep. guardian mirror, like it. If, I don't know if you watched the age game where I played against Chris and he was on Victor. He spinaled me and I forgot about it and I tried to make a surge and do something sure. and that basically lost me the game. Um, but yeah, don't forget yeah. this one. Because yeah, it's I a don't, big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, even, let me try to think, uh, any non-attack based decks, Rune Blades, etc. They can't like uh, play something and then Shrill or Mav or whatever, right? right. Um, so Spinal is just a very, a very good card. Like it would be a main board card, but there are some matchups that I don't run it. Um, can't think off the top of my head which matchup that would yep. be. We'll, we'll moment, go over it in yeah. a second. We have some buttons that we'll be able yeah. to look at. Uh, and then the other disruptive card that I see here is the, the Pummels, right? Yeah. So Pummel is a really good... It's a good card. I think people have like gone away from it and like feel it's like less good now. But even back then, I do think Pummel wasn't like the most amazing thing in the world. Um, obviously, if you're on a Tunic Bravo build, Pummel is really good because if you're on the CNCs Very or strong. Weakest Links, then you can do yep. the three-card Pummel. Um, and Oldham could do that, which is a big reason. But uh, obviously, if you're playing that, then it's a little more awkward with like your Anathos hands or if you're on Titan's Fist with a shield instead of Anathos. Like if you're ever stuck with two cards, you can only really translate that to four if you're on Titan's Fist. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you're on the Tectonic build like me, Pummel is basically always like a four-card hand. And sometimes that's bad because you don't always want to commit every card in your hand, like blocking one card in some armor on a CNC. But whereas for me, if I want to keep all four cards, I need to like slam six armor in front of it. Right. But I'm okay with that because like I can kind of decide, you know, this is the time to go all in or this is the time to just block and wait for a better opportunity. Um, but yeah, I think one of the biggest struggles is that Enigma, for example, this is not really efficient damage wise. It's only efficient if it hits and you actually force them to discard a card. Otherwise, it's two cards or two resources and a card for four damage, which is okay, I guess. Like, if you think about it in terms of like Zealous, that's like two cards and or a card and two resources for five damage. Right. But, um, yeah, it's this is also it, another reason why it's on par for reactions. Things, yeah, it's on par that. for reactions, but it doesn't push Bravo to that next level in terms of damage it's, it's kind of just on par with everything in the deck is kind of on par right sure so <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, and then when you hit that's the, yeah and then when you hit that's when you're like oh this is great um right and i'm getting tons of value but yeah so many matchups it's really difficult to hit now so it's yeah so that, a lot of times that i i found when i was playing tech plating um you you would have to keep like four card hand to be able to play like a command and conquer pummel like that's just the way mm -hmm. that it goes right you know, there's really yep. no other way to do it whereas that's why a lot of people um in guardian nowadays have been playing uh tunic like specifically victor is the more popular one and everybody's on tunic because they can mm -hmm. go weakest link cnc like what you're talking about and then also you know triple pummel they're always like slamming that pummel every single time they hit that third counter on uh those two cards or spinal crush right yep. A lot of times, though, people don't, they underestimate Anathos with tech plating because you send in six, you're always representing Pummel. And the times that you do have Pummel when they decide that, oh, you know what, I'm just going to take it. And you send 10, there's, oh my God, I'm almost <laughs> yeah. dead. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's actually like not bad. It, in a way, you can think of it as like build your own Thunderquake. That's the way I like to think about it. Yeah. It's like it's build your own mm -hmm. red Thunderquake because it is three card 10. Yeah. So it's not bad. And it has, yeah, it has the upside of going on attack actions to make them discard, and right. it has the slight downside of blocking too, but yeah, it's, it's a good card. I just think that uh, for non-Guardian players, I have one, one, I have one person in mind specifically who thinks, who thought like, who thinks Pummel is like one of the most broken things in the game, and I'm like, it's good, but it's not like, it's not like that good. <laughs> hey, when it works, it's broken. When it doesn't work, it's very bad. <laughs> so it just, <laughs> yeah. it is what it is. It's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay um we have two more card well i guess three more cards technically yeah um so the last section is... would be like defensive cards right yeah yeah go ahead so like sinks fates that all you got sigil mm -hmm. 
Um, I think Sigil was definitely more of a last meta product. I don't know if I would play it um, if I had updated the deck list and tested more now. But I like Sigil because, one, once again, consistency. Um, it's just always representing three value no matter what. You know, sometimes your opponent full blocks your big attack and you have right. four cards and it's like two blues, a spinal, and another red, but you already have something in Arsenal. So it's like, oh, I kind of like strand a card here. But if it's a sigil, you just get to play it whenever. And also there's bluff potential of like, if I play CNC, make a surge, I'm keeping two cards. They're thinking about pummel. I just sigil Arsenal and pass. Um, I think it was also, I really like doing that uh, play line against Brute because I try yeah. to bait out their scowling flesh bag. If I go like um, like CNC and I have two cards and one of them's a sigil, they flesh bag me. I just play the sigil and I get to arsenal my last card, right? Exactly. So yep. I I liked it for that reasons, but you know, with new, I mean, sigil is probably fine against new. If well, I actually think it's strong this meta still. Yeah, it, it depends, right? It's like for against new, for example, the game can go long, and sigil is a pretty good card when games go long. Also, their daggers, it's essentially an efficient block on their daggers because you don't right. want to be blocking one with one card the issue is that if the game goes longer which sigil generally does then new reaches second cycle she's stealing your cards so sigil is good in the style where you're playing more fatigue and you have less attack action blues um again zen you wouldn't really play it because you just need a hit same thing for enigma um but against any like even against ranger it's like an okay card like i think against ranger you generally want to hit them also um but against riptide if you want to just run them out of damage in their deck, Sigil helps with that, right? So sure. it has its places, but uh, even against Kano, if they're on Kindle, like sometimes that little three life can surprise them if it's in your arsenal. Exactly. But uh, if they're on stack, then the three life is basically non-existent because they're hitting you for like 200. So Yeah, a lot of Kanos I've seen have, because they're all playing Kindle, they will kind of just like go off whenever. But if they're stacking, yeah. of course, like, yeah, it's very hard. But um, just them trying to do their math tables right just do do it in their head and they're like okay you know like oh i have it zach lethal and then you play the sigil but they were on like uh you were attacking them for lethal like it'll win you the game on the spot and this was more yep. of a thing back in previous metals that i found that um this might have been before wildfire honestly but um having the sigils was actually a huge deal for um just kind of throwing them off so i've always been a fan of sigil i absolutely love this card and um, the altering arts look so good too yeah oh yeah there, there's a couple of them now that are just awesome yeah. they're so they're so nice mm -hmm. okay so sink low is a staple yeah a lot of I, decks in a lot of decks yeah it blocks for four which is already above rate obviously right. the downside is that you have to block with it and it pitches for one but in general you know blocking for four is good and then the fact that you get to filter is also really good because yep. uh bravo generally needs very specific hands he needs like one red and this many blues and sigil or sync helps you do that or sometimes yep. you have a four blue hand you're like all right let's fish for a red you draw the crippling off the top it's great um it's just a good it's just a good card like i think any deck that isn't very specifically playing some sort of synergistic way whether that's mechanologist boost or maybe like you know zen just wants to transcend and do his own thing any non very proactive deck for the most part runs sync below yep is it, it's just a consistency enabler another yep. another one so like like you said you know it's it's another crowd of providence in a way besides your arsenal yep. obviously but like you know mm -hmm. hey i need to get rid of this uh traditionally bravo played paper scenes as well as a three yep. of, and it was more consistency. It helped you, like, you know, set up your pitch stacks in certain matchups and whatnot and allowed you to, you know, just be able to get there and not have as many clunky hands because you are playing a lot more blues. You can dig to that red that you need. You can dig to that pummel that you need or something along those lines. So, obviously, yeah. great card. Obviously, defensive card, so you don't play it in everything, but um, yeah, definitely consistent. And then you have that all you got. So you're playing this over favor scene, for instance. We since we just talked about it, um, yeah, this seems like a meta call. So tell us about that. Yeah. So in general, I was never a huge fan of three favor scene. I would generally run one, and that's I wouldn't say that's like the correct choice. That's just what I have found in the way I play, maybe. Sure. Um, I think in, in times where I run three fate, I struggled to figure out how to get like a clean 60 into a certain matchup because generally I'm also running more blues than other people. So sure. that cuts into like what you can run as well, for example. But, um, yeah, also 
just too many D-reacts sometimes doesn't play well into the I need to keep hitting them kind of gameplay. Um, against, I guess, let, let's, let me try to split it up. Against like a ninja, uh, I would keep sync below just because it helps filter it helps give me consistency mm-hmm. whereas fate for scene helps set up for the next turn but like i want something now so that's that was yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. my, my that issue with fate. against like a brute fate is perfectly fine because the game probably is going to go a decent amount of turns it's not like you're going to blow them out of the water with back-to-back disruption anyways because they have so much armor especially sure. like levile she has husk right so fate definitely is great there it helps you know block pulping and just block you for four that's just good value right um for that all you got it's more of like a i'm trying it out uh if Warrior was big in the meta, that all you got would be better. Like if Hatchets and uh, Kasai was still a larger portion of the meta. Sure. Um, it can be good against new, you know, drawing a card, blocking like a dagger or two, or or like, yeah, blocking like the blue dagger. Um, whereas if you let it hit, they would get potentially two value on it. So uh, yeah. I'm not, I wouldn't say this is like a must play or anything. It's just something I'm trying out. But it has its, it has its spots. Like even against Zen, like if you need to block a little bit, hopefully you draw another blue and get to play your stuff. But uh, it can definitely be awkward uh, relying on the top because if like you really want a blue and you draw a red and you block in a way where you're banking on that blue, then it gets really awkward. Um, right. Obviously, you can still make decisions so that you don't need to gamble as much with the card off the top. You could be like, okay, I have a surge up. If I draw a blue, I dominate. If I draw a red, I'll just arsenal it or something. But yeah. No, it makes sense. I I think the new uh, matchup makes the most sense, at least to me, being able to block that dagger, the uh, mm-hmm. the blue dagger, I like to call it, right? Uh, yeah. The one that allows their blues to gain attack and also uh, go again. Being able to stop that and still present something back on your turn, you know, you, maybe you get a, a good arsenal because you didn't have an arsenal or you send forward, like, still pretty solid. So, all that makes sense to me. Um, I... I would go back and forth between this card and maybe like favor scene or something along the, or maybe another disruption piece. Like I, there's a lot of flexibility at least yeah, probably with this last spot. You can um, put in like weakest link. If you right. really want to try yeah. to be illusionist, you could even throw like yellow zealous in there. I've run yellow zealous in the past. Yeah, I have too. And it was like, it was like the only thing that let me be OG prism, right. but that was pre Everfest. Once Everfest came out, I don't think there was anything Bravo could do, but yeah. 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 No. Uh, I agree. I agree. I am also fond of Yellow Zealous and Yellow Lead the Charge. I played that in the past as well. Yellow There's a lot of like crazy stuff that's been played. Um, okay, so the last bit is now we're just on the armor, right? Mm-hmm. So balance adjustment of Justice uh, to Norun, a Time Skippers, and then a Van Brace. So uh, balance of Justice, we have seen this card pop up a lot a lot of people are just playing this in general because inherently this card is by itself a block two and then a another block three at least in our deck right it's it's five value mm-hmm. on these turns against yep. like uh brute and ninja right yep so um you think of anything else that this card really does it's just it's a five value hat it's really good right yeah five value hat's really good i think that at least during the heavy hitters meta, I ran both Providence and Balance of Justice, but I can completely uh, understand or see the reason behind just Balance, for example, because, right. uh, for example, KO is a really tough matchup because it's not a matchup where you can just chain disruption and hope to win. They're going to stop like two of your turns and do their thing. So Balance right. of Justice being a five value hat there is just better than gambling a lot of the times with Crown of Providence. Like sometimes Crown of Providence can save you if you need an Arsenal of Blue. Um, because in that sense, it lets you exchange a card that would have been stranded for a new card that is potentially useful, whether by blocking three or by pitching. So in that sense, it could be a five value hat, but sometimes it also, you gamble for something, you whiff, and it becomes only the two value that you blocked with, for example. But yeah, balance is just very consistent, uh, whereas Crown of Providence lets you take a little more aggressive gambling plays, which I like. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. That's why I run both. But yeah. I could completely see just running balance, for example. There's also is, Kano. If they tome and draw two, then you get to right, draw another card. Right. To- yeah, that's a big deal too. So you're not playing Hood here. So you would play this hat against Kano, for instance. Yeah. Well, it, this is more of a I need more slots in my deck type of thing. If sure. if I had like even two more slots in the deck, I would probably run A B three with the null rune hat. But but, but this isn't uh, like a bad replacement no, is what i'm getting at. like it's still it's, there it, it's yeah. it can it allows you to maybe draw another blue and ab3 yeah. 
more times or i say ab2 ab2 one and a half more times right because you probably have some floating so norun uh norun is obviously there for our arcane dealers right so you're playing both of these against kano um you're playing probably one of them against you know some other various decks like your rune blades and prism for example right potentially yes okay so um am i missing anybody there I don't think so. I think it's mainly the rune blades. I think prism. I would probably still just go with the armor chest or the sure. armor sure. gloves. But yeah, you don't necessarily need it. I I have found that yeah. as well in testing that like just having the extra block sometimes is a little bit more important. Okay, yeah. let's talk about time skippers. This one uh, people don't see as often, but you know, we'll, we'll kind of yeah. give them an idea of why this card is in the board, right? So this card is here for prism, and I have because of the arc light sentinel loop right if they get sure. the her- uh the angel of rebirth out with the arc light loop you basically they eat your action point every turn basically so if you pitch a blue and a time skippers you gain two action points you destroy the arc light with an attack um and it has to be an attack that only takes two cards so like east strike or zealous or something like that because your last card you need to hammer the angel that's getting the arc light back so that's one way to stop the infinite loop that basically loses you the or wins the game for prism however in testing i don't necessarily think that time skippers is necessary i found that the games where they do loop you they just kind of rolled with their tomes and regardless of what you do they were going to loop you anyways and they probably already got so much additional value from that turn that even stopping the loop puts you so far behind to catch up yeah uh i I do even enjoy just keeping civic steps because if you have the full fridge, you can basically stop any Herald from hitting. And in general, Prism really needs the Heralds to hit so that they can generate soul, they can search the figments. Um, if you're popping every turn, and if you have like a turn where you want to use all four or five cards, and you just shove your armor at them, and you're like, here's a Pulverize, then like they, you, can, you can aggro them, basically. Especially sure. because this, this traditional deck, the whole deck is poppers. Now, you will get caught off with their, their instants that like buff their heralds or like minus attacks your poppers. But if, for example, your hand is like Spinal Blue Blue and a uh, Crippling, right? Maybe, you know, you pop with the Spinal or you crop, pop with the Crippling with, with a higher attack card just so you don't get like combat tricked by Prism. Um, but yeah, I don't necessarily think Time Skippers is necessary, but I just, it was in the deck to sort of show like um, something you could use for Prism. Because I do think there is a niche situation where you can break the loop and come back from the game with time skippers. It's right. just that in practice, I do think the boots generally are more valuable. Um, the second opportunity for this card to shine is if you're playing against Enigma, because armor realistically matters not at all versus Enigma. They're just kind of hitting you for damage and will overwhelm you. So there are some niche turns where you can do some stuff like um, destroy time skippers. Maybe you have a surge out, you can go uh, choke slam into hammer, and that's like a four card 14 which isn't amazing but it's like in guardian terms it's like sometimes the best you can do it's it's pretty Um, strong it's uh it it might be enough to clear the board which is kind of like your goal on that matchup right yeah yeah and the fact that it's like an armor piece and it's always there means that like hopefully you can cash it in at the opportune moment to sort of like kill their mirror guy or with their important ward card the issue is that it requires like more specific hands which can be hard to line up but yeah yeah, I've uh, played Time Skippers off and on for a little while. Again, I agree with pretty much all of your points. Um, I don't necessarily think you need it because in a lot of situations when you're playing against that Prism and they do have their Tome go off turn, they are going to generate an axis of like, or two different axes that they will kill you with. They will kill you with the Angel situation and they will kill you with... Um, like a herald situation as well when it comes to like playing their auras that make it to where their heralds lose phantasm and so on and so forth like you will die to one of those options you can't kill everything mm-hmm. right so yep. the time skippers if that happens like you're you're dead like that that's all there is to it doesn't matter if you have time skippers not sure you can get out of the loop but like you're still dead to the heralds like they have pierce reality yep. and they have uh passing mirage right and you're just going boom boom mm-hmm. boom 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 you're dead <laughs> like it is what it is i still think this uh has a little bit of merit though because in a situation where this could actually make or break you winning the game 
in some cases. And if this is like a slot that has utility elsewhere, it's not bad. Like you said, against Enigma, it has a little bit of utility. Um, I have actually played this against something like Dash IE, like the traditional Dash IE with the pistol mm -hmm. package where, um, you know, they might here or there play a t-bone or something you can throw this in front of it not that that's like the reason yeah. you play it but uh the yeah. big thing is just to be able to get an extra action point kind of capitalize off your e-strike draw card something along those lines there there's a little tricks that you can do here and there okay yeah so then vambrace uh is the last one i'm a huge fan of this card so i understand this one completely but let's tell everybody else why you have this in your deck too it's mainly for Enigma, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. Like if Enigma that, wasn't a thing, no one, no one would play this card. Right. Uh, Enigma sets up the ward, and if you can't clear her board, you will just eat a lot of damage, and the ward will build up and build up until right. you're basically out of the game completely. And so this just translates anytime you have a floating resource to another point of damage technically if they have ward. Obviously, if they have nothing on the board, it doesn't do anything. But if they have nothing on the board, then the game's going well. So Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, even like your bad turn of Anathos for six, if you have Tectonic, it all of a sudden is basically now seven, right? Because of Vambrace, because right. you have the extra resources. Um, but yeah, just the extra one at any point. If you're on like a Tunic Victor build, obviously um, you're likely running this because that Tunic can yep. always transfer to another point of value when needed. Um, in Bravo, it's a little more finicky because... For example, let's say you have two blues and a spiral. You're like, do I make a surge or do I save it to Vambrace? It's a little sure, more awkward. Sure. Um, but in general, it's just like a necessary card to deal with probably one of your worst matchups in the game right now. Right. Yeah, The a lot of times playing against Enigma, they're going to have a couple of shields, right? So if they have one shield and they're trying to bank on that shield protecting their Ward 3 aura, which is generally how that's going... Um, this completely throws off that math and now they have to adjust by either giving you another card or something along those lines, which uh, can actually make or break the game in a lot of cases. So I've been a big fan of this card. I've played it a lot in uh, Victor. I've played it in Oldham in the past as well. Not so much Bravo, but I can definitely see, at least for the combat tricks, especially with Anathos, the reason this card is so good is with Anathos being able to do the extra attack action. Because if you think about it, right, the way you make your hammer bigger is you pitch to make a surge, you attack for six. Well, you can also just attack for four. They can honestly make like a pretty, you know, unassuming mistake seeing that it's four. Say, okay, yeah, I'll just give you one card. I'll take one of my shields away. And it's like, actually, no, this is now six plus the mm -hmm. pr damage prevention. So the seven, right? And now you get one of their other cards and they're just like, oh, crap. Like, this is horrible for me, right? So there's... um. There's a lot of opportunities with this, a lot of tricks, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. you need tricks to win your harder matchups. Yep. No. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so for the notable maybe cards, do you have any maybe cards? I know you don't have any here at least. Mm -hmm. Um, cards that like some spice you might want to put into the deck that might be good uh maybe this meta or and the upcoming meta like rosetta's coming out obviously or is there any kind of kind of stuff that you think you might want to start leaning towards yeah so two answers for that if you want to try to change up this deck this specific deck a little bit there's definitely other cards you can run like out muscle red i've un run out muscle red before against kano yep. it's a great card because it's basically guaranteed six go again into six right. three card 12 is like pretty uh, that's pretty good <laughs> but, it's very strong um, it's very strong and it, against enigma and new obviously it's also good but it can be a little more scary if they have like the random cnc or right. uh six power card um if you're on victor it's much easier to get away with if you make some mites because all of a sudden your out muscle is coming in for nine or ten and exactly. realistically yeah. they don't have a nine or ten block right so out muscle is definitely a great card it shines a lot more in victor now that he has uh, cast homes but yeah. um that's another good aggressive card that you can put in f to compete on that like damage axis that you need for certain matchups um you can run fate still if you're you know worried more about KO or maybe your meta has a lot of warriors and stuff so you want to play like a better long game uh tunic sure. is a good consideration as well um 
the deck can stay largely the same between Tunic and Tectonic. It's just that, you know, maybe you cut down on the blues a little bit, you run the third pummel, and you run some weakest links to sort of, like, play into that more. Um, Trying to think about what else. Uh, Big D-Reacts aren't really the flavor right now, so I wouldn't really consider that either. Um, And then on the completely different axis, if you want to completely retool the deck to play a Fatigue style, that's, like, a completely different deck. You would need to change all the blues. A lot of the reds can stay the same because you want those good disruptive uh, cards, but... Uh, I think the one major benefit a fatigue style Bravo deck has over traditional, quote unquote, traditional Bravo, maybe to some people, fatigue is traditional, but um, is that you're not as costed into the three cost cards, which means um, like if you're on Rampart of the Ram's Head plus Titan's Fist, you don't care about the Anathos needing three cost cards. So you can run right. good stuff like Hold the Line. You can run Warmonger's Diplomacy without w- all these like good generic cards that don't cost three or more. You can put into your deck without worrying about the Anathos factor. And so you sacrifice your damage potential and the good matchups uh, for that, whether that's Prism, Enigma, Kano, to sort of play a more good stuff deck, I guess is what people could call it. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, those are solid options. Um yeah, I've been kind of toying around with the fatigue, you know, just kind of theory crafting what would be good in this meta. Um, yeah, yeah, basically you're sacrificing your damage output, but you're kind of trading that off for defensive output and deck damage, mm-hmm. right? It's a different kind of damage. You're not yeah. damaging them, you're damaging their deck, and then eventually they will get to the point where you will just kill them because your weapon is more efficient. And you have mm-hmm. uh, cards that allow you to discard cards out of their hand which is important, like your Crippling Crush. This is why uh, Bravo is one of the better fatigue decks out of the Guardians to play, is because you get cards like Crippling Crush. You can dominate Crippling, get the last couple of cards out of their hand that they would be able to use to potentially kill you. Um, and same thing with Terra Sunder. Of course, the other Guardians can play this as well, but uh, in general, I see Bravo as one of the better ones to try to do a fatigue game plan where you play your Rampart and what you're talking about here. Uh, maybe some other spice that I've kind of played around with too, like you were talking about the beginning of this video, was um, kind of the aura build. Now th- that's yes, kind of spicy yeah. too. Um, I forget the name of the red aura. Well, there's a couple Earth of red auras. Yes, that one. Yeah. Earthworm Empowerment yeah. is Those pretty are the sweet. Are most popular. Yeah. And if for the viewers that don't know, Earthworm Empowerment is an aura, so it takes up your action point. It costs three. It's red. And on your next turn, your next guardian attack action. So not your hammer gains plus five and minus one cost. So all of a sudden you can crippling for two blues and it comes in for 16 instead of 11. Uh, Obviously it needs to line up. That's the sort of issue with auras. And sometimes taking an off turn can be really scary um, against certain decks. But for example, like even against Zen, right? If you're not attacking them, they're not getting that free chi from Traverse if you're playing an aura. So it's like not too bad. Um, Against warriors, maybe they can't even use all four of their cards. But when you, it, it, it can be scary, but when you come in for right. like really big damage and really disruptive effects, then uh, it can line up really well. So you, you make a good point, right? Like you're taking an off turn against Zen where inherently like you send something like a choke slam, they shove their armor. Well, if you make it plus mm-hmm. five, they're not shoving their armor anymore because it's not doing anything to stop it. So that's that's honestly kind of interesting to think about. Maybe something that we uh, we might see in the future if we keep seeing all these like, you know, pumps matter style decks, right? So. Yeah, I think that probably the only sort of like access that worries me is that if you're playing a more fatigue-ish style deck with auras, they kind of like solve similar questions. Whereas like the Zen matchup, it's like, okay, I'm just gonna block and not give you your six chi or your your free card chi, and every now and then I'll throw a crippling, which you can't full block with your armor anyways. Um, whereas with auras, it's like you can kind of do a similar thing. But, you know, against decks that you're already fatiguing, it doesn't really matter too much. And then it's a question of like, okay, what happens when I put auras into the Enigma matchup? If they already have a board, then taking an off turn to make my next turn better is maybe okay. It's Or maybe it's completely punishing because they just set up more ward. They put 10,000 years on the board or something um, when you put your aura up. Conversely, if they have nothing on the board, it gets awkward because you don't want to expend your high damage cards and they set up afterwards. They eat it, they take a bit of life, and then you can never crawl back from what they play but maybe yeah. you set up an aura while they have nothing then it's like okay now whatever you play i'm gonna get rid of no matter what so it's 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 awkward it's it's, it's swingy and the game will probably go long and on average it probably isn't great but it's 
I don't think it's necessarily bad per se. Yeah. But the yeah. issue is the lack of go again. I'll go ahead and pull up this card while I'm thinking about it. Yeah. All right. This Earthworm Empowerment right here, that's what it is. So the lack of go again is really the issue with these kind of cards, right? It's mm -hmm. you're taking an off turn to set up. Inherently, that's not a terrible thing, but at least in the meta that we have now, it, it honestly is kind of bad, right? Whereas, mm -hmm. like, the reason it works in Victor is the cast homes or visit goal plane estate. I'll use the real name. Um, it has go again. <laughs> it has go again, and it gives yep. you pump. It's like the reason it's good is because it has go again, right? So if you have... And you draw a card. <laughs> and you draw a card. Like, there's so many good yeah. things. There's a reason I love this card. Anyway, <laughs> back to Bravo. Yeah. Um, like, Stonewall Confidence, for example, is another card that I've been a big fan of for a long time. This inherently has go again. But the issue is it is not providing a damage buff or anything like that, like these other auras that lack go again. Right. So like you're adding defense, sure, but like you don't need more go again on your defense turns. You know what I'm saying? Like you're playing defensively anyway. The most you're gonna do is swing hammer. So it's kind of like counterintuitive in that sense. Um if what I expect, kind of off topic just just for a little bit, is <laughs> there will eventually be a guardian that will be an aura matters guardian, maybe. And when you play an aura, you get your first aura gets go again or something. That mm. would be pretty sweet. I'd, I'd be all be, over that. I think that might be a little broken, but... Ah, uh, no, nah, well, nah, it's broken? fine. Cause, it's fine. Because let's imagine every Let turn dream. you're just going crash down Anathos for six. Next turn I get plus six. You go right. Earth Lord Empowerment Anathos. Yeah. Next turn I get plus five minus one resource. Like, it would be good, but like... Okay, I say broken in the context of Guardian, which is not broken right <laughs> broken so and guardian maybe, maybe, is different from being broken maybe yeah so maybe <laughs> maybe it wouldn't be that bad or maybe it would be i'm not sure but yeah yeah so like crash down for instance so next guardian attack action if they rip the cards out of your hand it doesn't do anything right yes so so well, all right, let, let's just dream let's just dream for a little bit but we'll, we'll come back to reality and we'll talk about bravo so okay uh the next on the docket Right. We want to talk about uh, we kind of went over a lot of things, so we'll kind of, you know, speed up just a little bit on this. Um, in general, what would you consider the game speed of this deck to be? For for example, uh, Zen is the type of deck that will kill you in three turns. Right. Mm -hmm. This deck, when are you on average beating somebody? Are you getting to like a good mid game? Is it super late game? Is it like, oh, yeah. like sometimes you get there super quick, you know? Mm -hmm. so i think in general bravo is a more reactive deck than a proactive deck mm -hmm. you kind of need to change how you play based on the deck you're playing and so the the simple sideboard i have is kind of a a mirror to that you have the defensive cards for the matchups that you know are going to go longer like when you're playing against a warrior or a brute or a guardian mirror uh, any matchup that goes longer any few points that you can get in terms of consistency and value are going to be great then there's the matchups that you know they're trying to kill me fast, so I need to disrupt and kill them fast. Um, and so those are the uh, the decks that you want to put your choke slam, your spinals in. So that would be like your Zens, your Azaleas, where you know if sure. you give them too much, if you let them keep their cards, they're they're gonna kill you very quickly. So you need to kind of hit them with the good stuff. And then right. there's like you know there's specialized cases like Kano, for example. Um, it's a situation of if the game goes long, I'm probably dead. Um, so I need to be as aggressive as possible. And that also is generally the similar case for Illusionist as Enigma and Prism. Dromai is gone, but Dromai was a bit of a different case. That was that was a matchup where you it could go the distance. Um, but I would say the current uh, Illusionist, you definitely need to speed up the game because right. the longer the game goes, the more likely they're able to set up and accrue more and more value off their permanence and things like that. Sure. Yep, I think that's a great answer because the answer isn't just is it fast or is it slow? It's a, it, it depends, right? Which yeah. is Guardian in general. It's a reactive style class. Um, or at least in the way that we generally like to play Guardian traditionally. Yeah. Right? So yeah, if you're the fatigue style, style like it's going long every time. Yeah. But, yeah, that's fair. If you're fatigued, it's going yeah. long. If you're like hyper, except, super duper except, aggressive, you're going Except fast. for when you pair into an Illusionist or Kano, then you can just concede and take a break. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the go-to-lunch matchup. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So um, 
the next bullet point is going to be using life total and equipment, right? So um, mm -hmm. maybe there's a situation like when would you pivot? Like if you're playing against um, just let's say in general, like you're playing more aggressive style strategy, whether that's ninja or brute, and uh, you're playing more defensively, you're blocking here and there, and then you get, boom, here's my big hand. D where do I pivot? Like what yeah. would in general, what would the common heuristic be? of when you would try to take the initiative and keep it right hold the tempo so i think that this is kind of a nuanced question because even when bravo was playable like let's say pre-mst right like heavy hitters mm. um lexi etc he never was really like considered like a great deck in general he's kind of considered on the lower ish power level as a whole but you have good consistency so when it comes to using equipment or like trying to pivot there there are some matchups where you can afford to take it slower like against uh, azalea for example they don't have great armor so you don't need to dominate every single thing you play you can just you know throw a choke slam for two cards if you have a surge up and maybe they give a card plus perch that's totally fine maybe you block a little bit because the next time you attack they have basically no more armor right mm -hmm. um but against Zen, for example, maybe you just want to completely blow them out of the water. So you need to keep attacking um, and you need to get through their armor eventually, right? And K a KO is kind of a similar situation. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that matchups nowadays can be very swingy. And Bravo in general, whenever you sit down, you're usually the underdog unless you're paired into a favored matchup. So sometimes taking a gamble on your armor, even if it's early, can be those little points you needed to win later in the game, right? Yep. Um, KO, for example, I had a game in the Pro Tour where I went first, I was able to heave the Pulverize, and I draw into um, four blues. And he hits, he he isn't able to make an agility, which is great, on his uh, going into his first turn. And he hits me with Swing Big. I'm like, okay, I can commit all eight armor here to go Pulverize into Hammer. Is that enough to win me the game later and hopefully keep things rolling? Maybe. I don't know what I'm going to draw off Showtime. If I draw a red... Uh, maybe that's great. If he commits his flesh bag and I keep the red, it's a little awkward, but at least I get a good card to arsenal. Right. Um, right. If I draw a blue and he flesh bags me, he loses his flesh bag and I get to Anathos for go again. Right. Um, but then it's a little awkward because I wanted to keep the crown of providence in case I arsenal a bad blue, but you know, ideally I'm arsenaling a decent blue or a usable blue. But that's an example of like, I ended up committing all eight armor just so I can get those extra six points of value, right? I'm blocking eight, but I'm getting an extra six. Um, and it's, it's, it's very hard to judge. I think a general heuristic you can follow is to try to save your armor for later, unless you identify something, uh, very immediate, like you're getting CNC, but your hand is, uh, CNC pummel, right? And you right. just put this armor so you can CNC and pummel them back. That's perfectly yeah. fine. And I think the more you play around with like saving your armor, it's like, um, like you can just block six, maybe swing your hammer, try again next turn. But if your hand is good now and you, you want to play it, you can decide if committing your armor here is, is, is good enough. And depending on the matchup, you also want to save it. Like if you're playing a Bravo mirror, which you probably won't be, <laughs> uh, but, right. um, saving your armor so you don't, you know, just die randomly later in the game when they dominate crippling or something, right. Is important. Sure. Um, or if they tear us under you and you are in second or third cycle and you don't have D-Reacts anymore, generally saving armor. armor. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would say, once again, the faster you expect the game to be, the more aggressive you need to be with your armor. Mm. The longer the game is going to be, you should really try to save it for a crucial point that either uh, allows you to keep going aggressively or to fix something that went terribly wrong with your hand, right? Yep. Yep. Makes sense. So um, use your armor to make pivots. Makes sense. And then uh, using your life total also to make that pivot, you know, against a Zaley or something like that. I'm just kind of recapping here. Um, yeah. If it's not like a relevant on hit, it's okay to take that damage and then save your armor for like a, a relevant on hit later to be able to continue to hold that tempo because they're going to try to take it back at some point. But the second time you hit them, they're usually out of the game type thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, situations like that, um, I'd say in general, you you try to keep your life total a little bit higher unless it's one of those matchups where you do just shove armor, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All makes sense. Okay. So, next bullet is power cards. So, obviously, we know our power cards, right? We have yep. Crippling Crush. This is the reason to play Bravo, mainly. 
is uh, you know mm-hmm. your seven cost deal eleven. Uh, if it crushes, then they discard two random cards. So you pair that with uh, three blues, and you have the dominate here, and they have no armor because of the way you've been playing the game, and you were able to make proper pivots based on like our last examples and whatnot. You slam crippling crippling crush, and uh, you immediately steal the game, complete tempo, and hope to God that you draw some more some more gas, right? Um, yep. Which a lot more gas has been added, like we were saying before. So Starstruck is one of the newer cards, one of the best attacks in the deck. Honestly, this is um, more impactful in a lot of ways, too, than even something like Spinal, depending on what deck you're playing against. Because Spinal says they can't gain go again. It doesn't say they can't attack. This card says they can't attack which is crazy. Mm-hmm. It's so strong. And it has a block unity where if you block with another card that is not a defense reaction, uh, you know, at the same sequence where you're defending, then you get a surge. So when you play cards like choke slam or debilitate or anything that costs four, uh, you were able to go two card, here's that eight. Or three card, here's my crippling because I have crippling in Arsenal. Amazing, amazing card. These are the power cards in this list. Um, I'd say Rousey Ancients, honestly, is a pretty powerful card. It's a pretty yeah, staple. Uh, you need this in a lot of matchups. Honestly, you, you play this in pretty much everything, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you just have amazing consistency with the way that these cards are, uh, or the, the, the more bigger eights that have come out, right? Like, it's just, it's yeah. very hard to miss on this specific card. And it's mm-hmm. a blue. It supplements everything. The only downside is that it blocks two, but like most of well, the time, it can be it's a pitch. So exactly, you can stack it. It's now. there's so many no, ways no, to uh, play I'm this saying, card. Um, if if your opponent is on snag, then they can snag your rouse, which is something to watch. Oh, out for, but... you're saying it? Can, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, so what great card. The other <laughs> card that I want to point out. Uh, well, there's two more. Okay, tear asunder. Also mm-hmm. amazing card came out in Tales of Aria. Um, this is around the era that I started playing. Uh, maybe a little bit before. I saw this card. Love this card forever. Uh, it's basically Crippling Crush 4 through 6 in a way. like They get to choose what they discard, sure. But it's an mm-hmm. on hit instead of a crush. And it works on your hammer. It's like... It, it's good. It's good. That's all yep. there is to it. And then the last card... Mato Grande. Let's <laughs> let's be real. This is a power card. It's it's very strong. It's very strong. Like, it has won me a fair amount of games. Yes, yeah, I'll yeah. say that. Yeah. So like just being able to like arsenal this card, you have a surge that you set up because you went like uh you know tectonic plating hammer, and then your next turn you go okay you know block a couple of cards. Now it's a Mato without having to spend the resources to do the Bravo ability is a big deal. Now you do get dominate on any of these attacks with your Bravo ability, but sometimes you just don't have the card because you have to give a card. You're playing against Ninja and they're playing this pick game, right? You're like, okay, I have to give you a card. I have to give you another card. Mato, you're done, right? Yep. Always been a great card. Um, of course, every card is strong in their own right, but I would say, at least for me, these are the most powerful cards besides the generic staples that most decks play, like Commander Card. Yeah. Right. And then, you know what? Let's talk about Pulverize and Pummel. We've already talked a little bit about these cards and where to play those, but I mean, like, 14 is a huge number. It's 18 value in one card because of the minus four text. Yep. It's so mm-hmm. crazy. So most yeah. of the time when you play this card, it's like they lay down their entire hand. And if they don't, then you're probably dead. <laughs> That's usually mm-hmm. my situation. It's like a Zen is like, okay, yeah, whatever, take it. And then they go like, all right, uh, Crouching Tiger for minus four. Yep, no blocks. And then they're okay 30. <laughs> yeah. So. I would say it's only a little awkward if you're against like Katsu or Azuri or even New because they can eat up the minus four on their first Correct. Like, dagger yep. or something like that. But even then, like, then it's 15, and it's still good, you know? Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's still great. It's still a fantastic card. Yeah. And then, like we said earlier, uh, Pummel is one of those cards where it's like, when it's good, it's amazing. When it's bad, it's like pretty mid. It blocks two. That's basically it. You can pitch stack it. So, uh, you slam mm-hmm. it on your Anathos. It's always a 10 in general when you're doing that. Like, you know, in general, it's it's a pretty decent card to an amazing card. That's the kind of range that I would kind of look at it yeah okay so uh yeah the next thing and this will be the second to last is we're going to go over some of the top meta here and we'll just kind of go in alphabetical order to make it easy 
So uh, yeah. let's look at Azalea. So we'll look at the 60 that you're playing here. Um, so you're not bringing in E-Strike, Zealous Belting, that all you got in Sigil. Um, this yeah. makes sense to me, but maybe we can look at what's in the deck and why you're playing those cards and you can explain to the viewers on why you're picking these cards. Yeah, so in general, like I broke down the sideboard cards between like aggressive, uh, defensive, and uh, disruptive, right? So against Azalea, you want to be disruptive. So we're adding in the choke slams, we're adding in the spinals, and we're adding in the pummels. And pulverize is also really great too, um, because they, like you, they generally only attack once a turn in one big attack with pumps. And so pulverize will usually get that full minus four value. And if they want to lay down their hand and they have three two blocks, then you just insane value right. um obviously it, it's a clunky card and if and also because azalea is a matchup you want to go first because you don't want them to dominate you for free um so uh getting that high roll potential of heave pulverized turn one is really big um i would say even if you go second azalea is not even that bad like right. i've been dominated and like leak seven uh on the first turn but it's still okay if you just like crawl back you know throw some disruptive attacks and you generally get there um, right. And then Sink Below is a defensive card, but in general, Sink Below is just like a staple. If they're doing the usual physical damage, if they're not like Kano or Enigma or something, then just having Sink Below to filter is good. So even though it's a defensive card, it's just in a lot of matchups because it's just that good. Yep. yep. Makes sense. So kind of trying to dampen their effects here. Obviously, Tok Slam, that's one of the main reasons to play this card. Um, their, their whole deck is pump a big arrow, send the big arrow. Well, when they can't pump the arrow, they just kind of go, oh no, what do I do? Right. Yep. And then, um, uh, of course, the pulverize makes sense as well. Uh, it's just big damage. They can't really cover this up, and it makes their next turn very, very weak, right? Because of the mm -hmm. minus four. It's usually enough to be able to cover up with, like, the sink below or something by itself or the the armor. So, yeah. And then, yep. obviously, Spinal Crush goes without saying, you know, they can't get and go again. They can't pump their arrows. They're going to send a arrow if it's in Arsenal, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. So, super strong. Um, yeah, okay. So, Azalea, you'd say generally favorite matchup? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so Dash... Probably your most favored meta matchup out of all the meta heroes right now. Yeah. It's probably I, your most favored. I agree, I agree. So, uh, looking at Dash, and this is Dash Adventure Extraordinaire, the original Dash. Um, yes. You are playing... It looks like basically the exact same as yeah, so, Azalea. Yeah. So Dash is interesting because right now, in the past, whenever you sit across a Dash as Bravo, you know they're siding in all their pistol stuff. But now, um, in order to compete with like the swingier, faster meta, we're seeing more Dash decks go. Like, you know, they got Hanabi Blaster in the sideboard and they're boosting. They only have one induction chamber. They don't have any purifiers. So um, when it's that type of deck, you can pretty much threaten fatigue, so you don't need to go like full aggro with like your zealous and your um, e strikes and stuff like that. But uh, I would still just play like the good cards. Like sync is still a good card, pulverize is still a good card, pummel is still a good card. Um, I would say choke slam you could take out for like e strike if you wanted to, um, because uh, I mean they could play pounder, so choke slam does kind of have its use cases there, but. Um, yeah, it's pretty flexible. But if you're playing, if you know that your opponent has like the full pistol plan, they got like six, or they got the full three induction, three purifiers, then yeah. you would want to switch out your defensive cards like sinks and stuff for your E strikes and zealous. Yep. To just yep. kill them before they set up and outvalue you. Yeah. So you would just for uh, completion's sake, you would cut your sink blows for yeah. zealous beltings. You would add yeah. E strike maybe I would for the chokes. The uh, blue hold the lines for blue the hold two the e strikes, lines. and then just pick another red, probably like one choke slam or one spinal to yeah. for the last yeah. e strike. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, cut like a choke slam to hold the line, and then your sink blows going down to thirty six blues, which is pretty you know decently consistent, right? Which is kind of where yeah. you want to be. You have your extra crown of providence because you know they're attacking you every turn. You can filter that hand whenever you need to. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's solid. I like that. Okay. So, uh, in general, would you consider Dash to be a favored matchup? I haven't played against the new Dashes, but when I played against Hybrid Dash, I would consider it slightly favored. Um, mm. I think it's very... 
I think the onus is more on the Dash player more than anything to win that matchup because they have the end game that wins. They just need to figure out how to get there without dying. And your job as Bravo is to just hit them as hard as you can. So I wouldn't really think about it too much. I'd be like, oh, I got I got a pulverize in my hand. I'm gonna play it uh, for yep. the most part. Yep. Um, but in general, uh, track record would show that I think Bravo is slightly favored against hybrid dash. If they're the full defensive package dash, you don't win that because you can't sure. push through enough damage sure. before they hit Exodia or whatever you want to call it, right? But yeah. And then for the newer dash, I would imagine it's still a little favored just because to compete on damage, they need a boost. So you, you just need to adapt to slow down a little bit. But obviously the hard part is when you're sitting across from someone, let's say at a calling or a battle hardened, mm -hmm. you don't know how many items they have in their deck. So maybe you, you start out slow a little bit and you know they're going through their banishes. They're not playing any more items. You haven't seen them spark or something. Or maybe they block with a spark, and you're like, okay, maybe they don't want to play out items or something, right? So then, yep. then you can keep it slow, attack, uh, get your efficient trades, and either they deck out or you hit them with your big disruptive stuff. Now, if all of a sudden they play a second induction chamber, that's your sign you got to go, go, go. So right, yep, yep, I tend to agree. Um, the big thing is like you can't immediately know when they start the game because most of the time, whether they're boost dash or uh pistol dash or anything like that they're going to start with an induction chamber so it doesn't really give you any information if they start with the hanabi blaster you know what you're doing you should probably just shove your cards and wait on them to deck out or something along those lines you know play some efficient hands if you happen to see it you know like you have a yep. uh, easy choke slam or something whatever right um mm -hmm. or uh command and conquer is probably a better example um yeah, yeah. so but in general for let's say they're you know more boost and they're not playing the uh the pistol planned kind of like what dash is doing nowadays to kind of compete with zen you think that would probably be favored right like um yeah i would think it's favored. yeah yeah in general i i would think it's a little bit favored as well because you do just have like a significant amount of block um you you they can't really just like bust through all the the guardian stuff and the armor in general, especially if you're playing things like uh, sigil, right? Uh, maybe mm -hmm. that's another consideration. If you know they're on like the full boost package, you could play sigil mm -hmm. over something like the pummel because you know you, yeah. you're not gonna be playing the pummels in general, right? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, definitely. All right, so dash slightly favored, but it depends. It's well, contextual. I would say one more note: this sideboard. Yeah. Most likely probably applies to dash uh, IO as well, if you're running into that. It's mostly yeah. the same thing. They're going to boost in deck. You can play efficiently. And the, the main issue with the boost style decks is that they know that they're fatigable, so they will try to set up. And when they set up, that's when you hit them with your big effect, and they're like, now I don't get to play the game. Yeah, uh, that only got actually might be pretty decent in something like dash IO as well. Because you yeah. can stop their pistol and, you know, they have multiple things that are a little bit lower. It is a three block in general, but like getting the extra card might be, might be relevant. Just, just yeah. a thought, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Enigma, right? Yes. So this plan here, you're playing time skippers. No reason to play any Norun. This is not an illusionist with, uh, Arcane. One of the first ones without Arcane, right? Or maybe it mm -hmm. is the first one. So, okay. Enigma. So... For this matchup, for the most part, you put in all your aggressive cards, like the Zealous, like the East Strike, and you'll find this pattern pretty consistent across the other matchups where you want to go fast too, like Prism and Kano. Sure. Um, I still have Hold the Lines in. You could take that out, depending on what's in your sideboard, if you have like two more good reds that you want to put in. Um, you could even like throw in Choke Slam if you wanted to, instead of the Hold the Lines, mm -hmm. in order to like um, just have a better red uh, density. Because if you draw four blues and you get to do nothing on a turn, that can that can be really bad. So, um, but if you want the blue consistency, so you can like you know dominate crippling and do some stuff, then it's fine. Um, the big issue is that you're often not dominating with this deck because for the most part, they have instant auras, they have D reacts, they have a lot of wards. So it's like spending that extra card or two resources to try to push a dominate hit through usually is detrimental. Um, right. So that's kind of why the matchup is so hard because it basically blanks one aspect of your hero and you need to play the the numbers game and you don't do that very well compared to like a ko or even victor right sure yep no i tend to agree with this style of boarding as well just being higher on the blues because you do want to be able to make sure you play your things like polarize and you have a higher costed you know 
deck in general, right? You just got to be able to play yeah. these cards. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this plan is perfectly fine. I don't think there's anything like inherently wrong with, you know, like playing hold the line over choke slam. You need your blues. That's all there is to it. So um, in general, would you consider this to be a unfavored matchup? Awful, absolutely awful. Uh, awful. Okay. I knew it was. Well. <laughs> I knew it was awful when I was playing against uh, my friend Oliver, and they hadn't even fully spoiled the Majestics yet. He played sure. a common rare Enigma deck, and I was running hot. I got like CNC pummel. I was playing my Pulverize, yeah. and he killed me. And I was like, "Oh my god, this this is this is awful." <laughs> and yeah. I didn't think too much about it because I'm like, "This usually happens when a new Illusionist comes out, at least for Guardian. It's like it's hard at first, and then you figure out some ways to like get some points right. back into the right. matchup." Um, and I think Victor has kind of gotten there a bit with like, you know, you can run Snap, you can run, you know, Exude or whatever, right? And you can run um, Counter Dominion, you got Cast Homes. But as for Bravo, sure. he's kind of stuck because uh, yeah. he doesn't have those tools. Right, so, right. Yeah. Yeah, just not having the extra draw cards from a trounce is uh, <laughs> kind of tough. Oh, yeah. That's the reason yeah. Victor has like a little bit of game into Enigma. Still kind of hard, but like uh, being able to draw a bunch of cards and then say, here's, you know, seven mites in one turn is actually bananas for that um but yeah so awful matchup unfortunately uh still you could you can get there you can and maybe with the new builds of enigma that are more tuned towards beating zens and they're not playing as many like ward style effects um that matchup is probably pretty decent if i had to guess that was probably yeah okay. so like like the Guardian style Enigma decks where they just play Mirror Guy and D reacts and stuff. And yeah, they play like Mirror Guy, they play Rage Spectre, and then that like that's basically all of their ward. Yeah. They're not playing like 10Ks or anything like that, but they're better against like Zens and they're kind of built yeah. their deck to be a little bit better. Uh I think in general Guardian, like overall Guardian is probably a little bit more favored into something like that because I mean all they're really gonna do is like like you said, almost Guardian style Enigma, they're going block block and then play like some relevant thing, right? Yeah. So Cool. So next we have Kano. Um, I already know how this one goes, but you tell it's me. Basically the same, it's basically the same thing, except I swapped out the Pulverize for Sigil, because if you play a Pulverize with all of your cards, you might just die right then and there. Correct. Yeah. So, um, I mean, most of the time, if you're keeping a card against Kano, it's probably going to be a red that you're going to arsenal, and they kind of know that, and they're doing the math whether they can kill through that one AB. Um, but sometimes maybe it's a blue and you're like tripping them up a little bit, right? So right. Um, it could be a rouse, for example, right? Um, like if you're going to arsenal a rouse and they like, oh, I kill him if he has a red and they go off and you have a blue, then it's very awkward for them. But yeah, so it was this matchup was definitely tougher, I would say, during the Pro Tour heavy hitters meta because some Kanos were still on the first cycle kill you Kano plan into Guardian. Uh, the other, and some Kanos were on the D reacts, I'm going to pitch stack my combo and you don't have enough damage to kill me before then um if they're stacking sigil and anything like spell fray at least in guardian does not matter because you need to kill them before they reach their pitch stack right. but now that kindle has come out and more kanos are on the first cycle let's see what's on top and kill you type of deck then i would say things like sigil and you know a higher blue count is good for example if this was um if this was a stack meta Kano, like I would probably switch out the hold the lines for choke slams, just because you do need to hit them with good cards. Um, and if you draw four blues and you're throwing eight, and they're like, okay, I block with two cards, pitch, pitch. What do you got next? Type of thing. Um, but yeah, I would say like the sigil can trip them up sometimes. If a card's been in your arsenal for a long time, they might think it's Oasis. They might think it's Sigil. They're not sure. Um, if you really want to have more points into Kano, I don't necessarily think that Oasis is the way to go. Uh, unless you really hone in on that plan and go full three oasis fatigue style because if you arsenal oasis it just gets really awkward to play an efficient game plan and re realistically you need to kill the kano before right. they kill you um and oasis doesn't help with that it's it's very much like a Harold mary card like you drew it the one turn they decided to go off then it's yeah. like, amazing yeah. but in 90% of other turns, it's in your arsenal and it's like clunking up your hand that could potentially be very good. Like, let's say your hand is Zealous, two blues, and a crippling. Then you can go Zealous into Hammer, Arsenal, Crippling. But now your arsenal stuck with an Oasis. And the only way to get rid of that is by pitching another card. And so then it becomes awkward. Right. Um, if you're on Tunic, it's less awkward. But even then, the three-turn cycle can be a little awkward sometimes. Yep. Yep, I agree. Uh, 
yeah, Oasis is one of those cards where it's like you might play one of them in your deck with the hopes that you like when they're going off, you have the high roll of like seeing it because you're presenting enough damage. You just happen to got it right. Um, mm-hmm. There's situations like that. And I played uh deckless similar to that. And then there, the fatigue game style is like, that is your game plan. You're just life gaining forever. And then like you have your Oasis and Arsenal, you drew another one and they have to go off and then they can't kill you from, you know, like uh, 47 or whatever your life total is. Right. So mm-hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think in general, the sigil being flexible and being having game into these other decks uh, makes it really strong specifically for Kano as well, because you can be proactive. You can kind of mess up their math tables. Like we were talking about a little bit earlier. Yep. So yeah. in general, uh, what would you consider this matchup to be favored or unfavored? I would say it's unfavored, noticeably unfavored. Um, like yeah. if you, if you watch me play age, there was the one tournament where I beat a bunch of Kano's, but re- realistically, if if I played that matchup like a hundred times, uh, I don't think I would win more than like twenty five, maybe. And that's with the respect, right? Like I have the two AB, I have the sigils. Um, if yeah. you have three AB, then you're respecting them a little more. But it's like if you go down to one AB, that matchup becomes like a, a five percenter out of nowhere. Yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, is that one slot worth the twenty percent of an already bad matchup? That's kind of up for you to decide. So, oh, well, let's. Theory craft real quick. So if you were to add a third AP, how many percentage would that add in your mind? Maybe like 10 points. Maybe it goes up to like 35. If you add the spell fray cloak on top of that and you know that they're not stacking like they're on Kindle, maybe that even goes to like 40 is like pretty copium. But like three AB plus spell fray and and if you have out muscle, sorry, you need out muscle too then that really pushes your deck towards like, okay, I can actually beat Kano. Sure. It might not be favored, but it's like, it's not doomed. But in general, that's like uh, two AB slots, spell fray, three out muscles. And you can run out muscle in other matchups too. So it's not like only for Kano, but that's six slots for one matchup that's bad yeah. to not as bad. Yeah. So then it's like, w- what's the threshold for you, right. right? Okay. So you said this is like noticeably unfavored. Do you think it's, more unfavored than enigma or is enigma just like oh this is the worst is this like enigma is your worst one you want to see like you don't want to see it yeah i think enigma realistically is a a go get lunch matchup if they're on the ward enigma if they're on the guardian enigma, you can probably like maybe you can get there right but um if they if they got like the restless coalescence they got the cats they got the stuff then it's like yeah gonna be pretty tough Okay. Yeah, I was just curious because, like, Kano's always been that go get lunch deck for me. Whereas, like, the illusion is like, I'm willing to try this. It's okay. Like, against Kano, it's just like, I feel hopeless when I when I sit down most <laughs> of the time. But yeah, it's just maybe a, a difference in mentality. But uh, next, we're going to talk about a pretty relevant meta pick at this point uh, with Kao, right? So we're going to see Balance of Justice here and then all of these spicy, spicy cards. Um, so the I really like the way this deck is kind of shaping up with the ratios here because you have like basically the perfect number for everything. It's like you bring one <laughs> thing in, one thing out. You know what I'm saying? One, like yeah. it's just it's yeah. really aesthetically pleasing to me when you have these ratios correct. I don't, I don't, yeah. It's funny because I don't know if that's like necessarily the optimal way to deck build, but sure. I just like easy sideboarding. Like I don't, right. me yeah. personally as a player, I don't make a sideboard guy when I play. I always like take something out, put something in. Um, so when I build the deck in a way that's easier, um, to do, it just makes my life easier. Um, right. and if I really dig into it and like do all the ratios and math and like be like, okay, I can take out this one card to make this one other matchup better by putting this one card in here, then that's fine. And I think it's probably even better and you could have like a full sideboard guard so you don't like miss sure. out on things. But sure. in general, I'm just like, okay, I have my basis. I have like some flex cards and this is like an offensive flex card. This is a defensive flex card. So they kind of right. just switch depending on the matchup. But like, yeah. Okay. So KO. Yeah. So this sideboard is basically the same as the Azalea sideboard, which is, Funny because they're very different matchups. Correct. Now, um, there's two cards I didn't add into this sideboard. There's the two, uh, or it's mainly the two sigils. Sigil was a card I went back and forth on for the brute matchup because there definitely are times where you can like do some funny stuff and bait out their scowling flesh bag. It's like a consistent card, but um, I have found generally that just hitting them with good stuff 
is usually preferred. And if I draw a red and it's a sigil and I don't have like a choke slam or something to play, then it like it feels a little awkward. So I waffle between those back and forth. Um, you might be able to find space if you uh, cut different blues. Like I would keep hold the lines, for example, because they're in because of KO, right? Um, and I guess then to a degree. But sure. um, if you want to go to like the 36 red, because KO is kind of a matchup where it's like you kind of need a high roll a little bit, to be honest, because their value game is just better than yours and they have just as much armor as you. So you realistically can't push your stuff over. But for the most part, it's the same game plan. All of the disruptive effects that apply to like the Rangers generally apply to KO. Choke sure. Slam, not as much anymore because. It was great because, like, if they ever cast bones and you choke slam, then it's like, okay, I have to start with my weapon, which sometimes they don't want to do. Um, every now and then, you might be able to steal a mite of value from them with it, which is still good, but it's not like amazing. So maybe you can even like cut one choke slam, put a sigil. Um, I'm, I'm usually very flexible when I sideboard. I'll like switch out one card and be like, okay, let's see how this plays because I'm not sure. very hard set on like my matchups. But uh, Spinal Crush is really great because they need to block six on it. And if they don't want to give two cards, they need to commit one card and two pieces of armor and if it's like still early in the game that two armor is four and they don't want to block four right off the bat right. um right. when they want to really hit that six sweet spot so just trying to trying to find every little point you can matters um in that sense like crippling will come in if you dominate it it comes in for eight they can do two cards and an armor which obviously is not great but it's still fine it was it was the, the matchup was much better when they were on tunic because they only mm -hmm. had six armor. And right. so if you dominated a crippling early, which was one of the most important things to win this matchup, they needed to give one card plus all their all the three other armor pieces to block for nine. So you get that extra point of value of armor that could stop something else on the ninth damage point. And you like you break their helmet, you know, and they only have two armor left and tunic, but now that they have the chest piece, it gets really awkward. Like if they really wanted to, yeah. they could just shove eight and hit you really hard, which is like really scary. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the extra armor. Not, their armor is better than ours now, and I don't know how I feel about it. it that, that's like, why people complain about civic <laughs> that, yeah. That's the main reason. It's just like, oh, okay, Brute has better armor than Guardian, which had best armor. But we had, like, middling damage. So, like, it made sense, mm -hmm. kind of. We were the more defensive class, and now we have less defense than other aggro techs. It's crazy. <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, yeah, so so all that makes sense. Uh, you're also playing the pulverize in the matchup. Mainly, you're you're not really playing this in general in the middle of the game. Sometimes you can, like it just depends contextually. But like in general, if are you trying to like heed this turn one? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I never really came to a conclusion whether going first or second was better. I think across all my games against KO, I didn't notice a, a big difference. Like if you go first and you heave the pulverize, bam. 10 percentage points right there if you go first and you don't heave the pulverize bam minus 10 percentage points right there so then it's like and even with like two pulverize and the imposing and the show times then it's like high 40s that you'll hit it on your first right. turn yep. like at least heaving it but um yeah it's 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 kind of hard to decide whether going first or second is better it could be you know in general i would say the preference is to go second in most cases except for very specific matchups um even against ko going um Going first can be bad because they can discard the, the agile windup on your yep. turn one and then hit you really hard on their first turn. So going second is kind of preferred because even if they set up turn one, if you can hit them with something good, that can kind of slow down the game a bit and keep you hitting. So it could be, you know, if they win the die roll and they choose second, then you side in your pulverizes or maybe only side in one because you sure. want yeah. the opportunity potentially. Yep. Um, whereas if you're going, if you win the die roll and you pick second, maybe you only put in one pulverize and you throw in a sigil or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. Um, and there's a lot of like flexibility you can use with something like pulverize where it is more about, it's beneficial if it's, if you're going first mm -hmm. to have the pulverizes in your deck so you can more high roll in that sense, right? And be able to have something. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. That's uh, something I've done in the past as well. What I found is that uh, most of the time when I would get choice, I would usually go first because I've been I've been bitten by KO so many times <laughs> where they go first and they're just like cast bones. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Well, I know it's only they're, three they're cards in there. Right? That's true. That's true. Uh, yeah. Some of them have been cutting the cast bones because it's just not like what you actively want to be doing against Zen, which makes sense, yeah. which does make the matchup a lot better for Guardians. So it I'm does. not going to complain about that. But 
um yeah in general that's just the kind of success that i've seen in the past it was mainly just like i have to get my pulverized and if i get my pulverized then i feel pretty good if i don't get my pulverized then i am i gotta work i gotta work for it yeah so yeah uh in general would you go ahead in general i would say the matchup is i would say most of my experience is from heavy hitters um with the chess piece out i would say it's like well, let, let's go back to heavy hitters. In heavy hitters, I would say uh, KO was pretty unfavored if they were on cast bones. If they were on not cast bones and just like good value cards, I would say it's only slightly unfavored, like not even that much. I have noticed a lot that um, in heavy hitters, when I played against KOs with cast bones, some games would get close, but most games I would just get blown out of the water. And then against KOs without cast bones, the games were also close, but I was winning more. So maybe that's just a personal experience thing. Everyone's testing may vary, but that's just what I found. Now with the new chess piece and no cast bones is the current standard, I guess, right now for KO, right? Um, I would say it's probably still unfavored. Maybe even... Uh, yeah, I would just say still unfavored. It's not awful, but the extra armor on their chess piece really stings for Bravo because dominating that crippling at any point in the game to just say either you discard a bunch of cards or you give me all your armor and I get to have a good time later was a really key point um, in beating KO. And now that they have eight armor, it's like, mm, seems unlikely. No, I get it. I get it. That's why I was saying like maybe going first and heaving that bull rise is kind of like where you want to be. Like maybe yeah. that's your, your kind of, if you get the choice, maybe you go mm-hmm. first so you can try to do that because it does give you those extra percentage points. And if it's slightly unfavored, it then becomes slightly favored, right? Um, yeah. Assuming that you you draw like statistically average with your deck besides the turn one he pulverized, right? Yes. Yeah, I can see that. It's kind of a question of like, okay, I may not hit, but I kind of need this to win. So I'm going to go for it type of thing. Sure, sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So slightly unfavored. I also agree with that. Uh, talking about new now. So new yeah. is uh, one of the most annoying heroes to play against, period. I know that for a fact. Yeah. So personally speaking, <laughs> I have not played against a single new yet because uh, I took a break from the game around MST spoiler season. Like I've been keeping up with friends and like watching what's going on. And just from what I've heard is new is pretty awful matchup for like the traditional blue attack guardian. Now, Victor may have a bit of an edge because... He can just run a bunch of offensive cards and try to kill the new before they reach second cycle yep. and get to do all your yep. steal your card stuff. Uh, but against Bravo, he just doesn't have the damage output to do that. Um, maybe you can still push through with disruptive effects and kill them, and Outmuscle yep. helps there. But as we talked about before, Outmuscle is a bit better in uh, Victor because you have the the mites and stuff. Sure. But yeah, sure. Um, I don't have an opinion on how good this matchup is, but I'm going to assume it's quite bad. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I can go into it just a little bit. Um, I I agree with the majority of this sideboarding tech here. Um, there's some potential that you might even cut like a cranial, a disable, and a motto or something along those lines. You know, like just maybe two of those cards, like a motto and a cranial, uh, just mm-hmm. to make it to where there are situations when the new attacks you and they have a bonds, okay? And there are situations where you just don't want to block it. But if you have two cards of the same name, you are forced to block. It's just not possible otherwise because when they hit you and they activate all those things, they're taking your two blues. They're taking Cranial and they're taking the second Cranial and then they're taking the third Cranial from your deck. And then your whole turn's ruined anyway, right? So there's a situation where you could potentially do that um, and maybe play like the Choke Slam or something along those lines. But I do believe you kind of have to be a little more aggressive. I think that all you got while being defensive is also something that enables you to be a little more aggressive. Because you do have to sometimes just like put your that all you got in front of um, like the Dagger, for instance. So you can maybe draw your extra blue because you're playing a little bit more blues in this matchup. And then you can play your Crippling, which is a big deal. They don't have a significant amount of armor. They play defense reactions here and there, right? But um, mm-hmm. yeah, they they can't really easily cover up a crippling unless they want to give up their nightmare hat. Which is if they do that, then like, okay. hey, I'm go- I'm good with that. You take the nightmare yeah. hat, I'm happy. You know, like screw that card. That card's annoying. Uh, Sirens call super annoying card. There's just a lot of tricks that they do, which makes it 
makes it hard to play a reactive game plan. So the way that I have met, had success with Guardian in general against New, if I'm not playing specifically Fatigue, is to be proactive, right? Which mm -hmm. this is more so like that. I do like Sigil. I think there is some proactiveness there. But Chokeslam is one of the big ones. Like Their whole game plan, right, is for them to kind of play a bonds, pump it up to 10. They can't do it when you hit them with a took slam. So you're getting more cards out of them, which means that their next turn is going to be a little bit lacking. You can block a little bit less, shove your armor at like opportune points. It's not that bad. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So hopefully all that makes sense. If you have any comments on like, you know, holes in my theories and whatnot, happy for you to poke some, but, um, yeah, that, that's kind of my experience. I've been more so on the Victor side lately. So, um, that's kind of what I do. And I've had, decent success with it i think you could probably translate that uh with bravo in a sense yeah right yeah so i would, I would agree <clears throat> in general though i would say that this matchup um because you don't have the block cards that victor does uh this is likely to be unfavored I wouldn't say slightly unfavored. I wouldn't say extremely unfavored. I think it's very much like one of those matchups where you're playing um, you're playing Guardian against a traditional Dory or something like that. Like if you don't know their deck, they're beating the crap out of you because they're gonna mm -hmm. go pump, pump. You know, like go over the top, do all these things. You're dead, right? Whereas like if you know their deck really well and you know the position that they're in based on how many cards they have in their hand and how many resources they have you can kind of deduce what could happen it's a lot trickier than that dory player right where the in general it's a one cost here's a react plus three you know or like a zero iron song response something along those lines because they have a lot of varying attack but based on the context of the game how long it's gone you can look at their discard pile and see what they're Right. Like there's there's a mm -hmm. lot of situations where you can kind of show some skill expression, which we're we're honestly kind of not seeing a lot nowadays um, compared to what we used to. So, um, yeah, in general, slightly unfavored. Do you tend to agree with that? From my expectation of the matchup, yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you cut Terra Sunder here as well. Um, I just noticed that. that was just a I was, guess. I was like, yeah, maybe good. you keep it in. To hit them, but also maybe you don't want to keep it in because if they get it, that's really bad. It's Not it's sure. tough. It's tough. Like it's you're playing Anathos. I think I would probably in general try to keep this in, but man, like once they hit you with mm -hmm. that combo turn, I'm gonna call it a combo turn. It's really just activate their hero power, right? They do mm -hmm. that to you and they tear asunder. It's like actually pretty awful. So uh I can see cutting this as well. I think that's not unreasonable in the slightest if you're just trying to present a bunch of down i mean in victor i don't play the card at all so and uh, it's been mm -hmm. a lot better for that reason so yeah. um yeah I, it's very dangerous it's not a card you typically want to side out but I, it makes total sense it could just be like you keep it in because first cycle you're gonna want it and then regardless of whether they got one or not you reach second cycle and you haven't killed them yet then it's like bad either way so maybe it's a, sure. it's a keep sure. but yeah Yep. Okay. Good deal. So slightly unfavored. Um, but again, skill expression will honestly get you there. Um, in general, Guardian has a favored assassin matchup, I would say. Um, you know, against like Azuris and Arachnids and whatnot. So new, yeah. obviously a whole different world, but um <laughs> yep. you know, with enough knowledge, I think you could probably get there. All right, so Prism next. Uh, you're not playing the Arcane. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Makes sense why you're not playing that because you want to be able to push it in front of the uh, Heralds and whatnot. You're mm -hmm. playing the Aggressive Package, it looks like. So I'll let you talk about that. So, yeah, this is the Aggressive Package. You have the E-Strikes and the Zealous, um, mm -hmm. similar to Enigma. Uh, you have the Pummels, which are better uh, into Prism than Enigma because, in general, Enigma has more ward and more D-Reacts. Like, Prism will have soul shield and stuff but um pummel just still a good card pulverize also a great card you know minus four on a random herald all of a sudden you don't even need to worry if it's a popper or not you can just block three if this pulverize hit or right. if they want to full block their hand but they have like an aura or two auras in there and all of a sudden they can't then it puts them in a really awkward spot so uh, for the most part this is just the aggressive slanted uh mm. sideboard once again the two blues in the hold the line is optional you can keep it if you like the high blue count for consistency, or you can cut it for more reds if you want to try to 
make sure you have a, a big number threat every turn. And you could also argue that putting in like the choke slams, which aren't in right now, is just a good idea because they're eight power poppers. Um, sure. So that's a consideration as well. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Um, yeah, choke slam is just one of those where it's like it's not doing a whole lot here. Um, it is another popper, but there, there's a lot of situations like in this matchup where if they do combo, you have to play a lot of cleanup and that card just like, it's not really doing a whole lot as the cleanup package, right? So. Yeah. And then as we mentioned before, time skippers is also optional. If you want the civic right. steps, you can basically stuff any herald, which is pretty good. Um, right. a lot of times yeah. you can stuff two heralds, um, with like the, if they're the weaker heralds, like they play a blue or a yellow or something. But sure. Yeah. You can just full commit armor if you wanted to keep a hand and be able to like have that have that pivot like we talked about a little bit earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So And I guess it's not a huge consideration, but um I would say that I would probably prefer civic steps if I knew my opponent was on Iris of Reality, because Iris of Reality generally they're not going to um, go for the full arc light loop combo. They're kind of playing the usual aura sure, prism, sure. and that's kind of a niche, a, v a very niche deck. But since I am from California, I, I do run into it, you know, a good amount. Um, and you know, I have beaten it. Like it's not an unwinnable matchup. In fact, I would actually say traditional Bravo. If you really know the matchup, you're probably actually favored into Iris Prism, and that might be a hot take, but that's fine. Um, but Iris Prism is so niche. I don't expect that, anybody man. to play it. I don't know that you at just, all. I need some help. <laughs> just, I always have hard really time. Gotta hit him. You just really got to hit him. <laughs> sure, sure. No, yeah. I guess it makes sense if you like adoring some things. Like uh, there are some like key spots where you have to like kill certain auras and whatnot. I understand yeah. that, but it's like it's so it's contextual with an iris build. It's like it's actually yeah. very difficult to kind of pinpoint it's, where you need. It's to go. very difficult because for an iris build you generally can't really follow a heuristic for certain things it's like you can say oh you always kill genesis and for the most part that's true but sometimes your hand is just really gas so if you hit them and they have a middling turn can you kill genesis next turn maybe if you have a go again in your arsenal but your hand is instead like cnc pummel or something right you keep it you pummel them hopefully get some cards next turn you, clear, you get rid of the genesis uh it's it, but it and it can get awkward if they like block efficiently and set up more and then it gets really awkward um, and there's also that very fine point in the game where you need to say, okay, I'm not caring about anything anymore. I'm just going to go. And if yep. I don't draw gas, yep. I die. And that's fine. Yep. So I've been there. Okay. So in general, you think this is a favorite matchup? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. For traditional Bravo. Yes. Sure. Okay. I also tend to agree. Um, there are some really, really good prisms that, I'm sure are happy to tell us that we're wrong. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> and there are some situations where, like, I have heard of different strategies of Prism that where it's, like, almost impossible for any Guardian to beat if they play it in a certain mm -hmm. way. But, again, sure. Prism is one of those decks where it's, like, you know, a little less than half their deck is no block. So if you do just, like, full commit kill them, like, you, you just kill them, right? So it, mm -hmm. they can just kind of whip on that. I, I do think it's... I think for Prism specifically, it's less so about like who's favored in the matchup and more so who's better at their deck. That's fair. And to, be, fair. to be completely fair, it's easier to reach that threshold with Bravo than it is with Prism. So That's if also we're talking about like the two best true. players in the world, one on Bravo, one on Prism, sure, I'll put my money on Prism, right? But I probably would as well. Unfortunately, I hate to be that way, <laughs> but Prism does some really broken things. And if you can sequence it, perfectly or like pitch stack some crazy thing i know they shuffle a lot mm -hmm. but like if they did something crazy uh, my money would also be on the prism unfortunately yeah, even, even at like the deck building stage right like i i wouldn't yeah. would you say that the community in general is like oh prism solved now i don't think anyone says that no illusionist no, no, no. in general is never solved until like a year point five after their even start showing up in the meta right. and prism took a while to show up in the meta because she wasn't really printed until her new weapon came out <laughs> which, that's true which that's was, true yeah which was bright lights i think I, uh, I'm not sure. I'd have. Or was to it heavy? Look. No, um, it was heavy hitters. It was heavy hitters, right? It might have been bright lights, but it's uh, it's Luminaris, uh, Angel's Glow, right? Yeah. Lag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lag, lag is so good. It's so good. Yeah. Unless you're playing CS2, don't like that. But <laughs> anyway, so slightly favored. Uh, we have mm -hmm. two more matchups. So we have the Victor matchup. So um, 
I'm assuming this is going to be somewhat generalized as like the Guardian style matchup. And there might yeah. be some different ways to play against Victor versus playing against uh, Bravo or Betsy, you know, just to include her. But yeah. Yeah. So and you're playing 64 cards. This is the first time we've seen you go above 60. So when it comes to the Guardian matchup, I am once again mostly undecided whether or not to run Clean 60 versus. Um, boarding up. So let me talk about the advantages of each. If you board up, you naturally have more red threats in your deck. And what that means is when they play like a Zealous and you block three cards and you swing your hammer, you're not running out of threats. When you run a clean 60, you get to reach your second cycle faster, which means, you know, if you're paying attention to that and you're pitch stacking well, you can like end the game sooner because Victor just has armor, right? He doesn't run D reacts. Um, right. So there's that advantage. However, if Victor draws hotter than you and you're running 60, your deck will thin much faster and it's easier to lose in that situation. However, when you run 60, technically, on average, you should run hotter because your deck is more consistent. Um, so it's just a lot of small little variables that, and you should kind of see what works for you. Like in the past, I always ran clean 60. Then I tried boarding up a little bit. Didn't really notice that much of a change, but... Because I think the days of like uh, Guardian Mirrors going to like last ditch effort status is like it's not gonna gone. happen like, anymore. Mato Grande <laughs> completely took that out. Yeah, so there is a very strong argument to play a clean sixty, but you can board just a little up because sometimes those those extra few cards can be the difference. Like when you're both right. like in the trenches, just throwing blues at each other, and you just have two more reds in your deck than they did. Then like that's huge, right? And also with more reds, you can maybe say like your clash chances go up as well, right? So that's true. Yeah, that's another thing that I noticed that like uh, in the past I used to cut spinals and mm -hmm. just play things like choke slam. And you know the more efficient like you know with a surge, this is either a three card player or a two card play type thing where spinal is generally not right. Yeah. So I cut this in the past, but against something like Victor, I do actually see a lot of benefit of playing something like spinal because it allows you to have a higher clash dense deck which means that they're not going to high roll you more sure you have some misses in your deck you have sync below you have pummel you have sigil right and uh and showtime and imposing for that matter but they also have misses in their deck they play you know three to six clash cards and some of them play sync below some of them i uh, all of them play pummel right and they're all playing uh visit gold main estate right so that they have as many misses as you and your numbers are actually bigger than theirs. Every single one of them, for the most part, that isn't like, you know, shared across the two lists Same, yeah. are bigger, right? So like Crippling, Starstruck, these are bigger. Pulverize is not usually uh, super stock in Victor. Uh, it is played, but like it's not yeah. super, super stock. Um, this is just more cards that allow you to kind of high roll. And um, in a way, depending on how you have this built, as long as they don't high roll you, I don't want to speak for you, and I'll I'll see what you mm. think. But I I think it actually might be a little bit favored for the Bravo. Um, you know, maybe that's maybe that's a hot take. You know, Victor does have the high roll potential, like I said. But like in a normal game, I think Bravo has a little bit of an edge. Yeah, so I think it's interesting because I think from a purely theoretical standpoint, Bravo should have the edge because one, he has dominate. And two, if your decks are fairly similar, then Victor technically does not have the clash advantage. However, Victor can start with a gold sometimes if he chooses to use the helmet or if he chooses to run the shield and not Anathos, which most decks do now because with uh, Visit the Gold Main Estate, you don't really need Anathos anymore. Um, so on one hand, Bravo gets the swing for six. Victor has to play a red attack, but you know red attacks are pretty efficient by end. If Victor wins that first clash and he wins like every single one after that, then all of a sudden like that value game is very hard to claw back from, even mm. with Dominate, because they have just as good armor as you, right? Um, right? Minus the tunic. If you're if you're both on tunic, then it's basically identical. And you can argue that Civic Steps isn't true armor in the Guardian Mirror because you're never actually throwing it in front of a crippling. You're throwing it in front of like Zealous and Rouse just for the life gain. Um, so they technically maybe have you know one two ooh three four five armor so it's more like the older matchup kind of um i guess in that sense it can be you know 
a little more Bravo favored, but it's you 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 do need to find your spots for sure. And in general, if Victor is hitting you with zealouses and rouses before you're hitting them, it's I don't want to say the Guardian matchup has a lot of variance cuz it probably is the lowest variance matchup. One of the lowest variance matchups in the game. Generally, the better player will win. And the more aspects you practice, whether that's pitch stacking, whether that's, you know, um, knowing the threat density left in your deck, um, reading what they have, bluffing, etc. There's a lot of aspects you can improve on in the matchup. And so, realistically, if you put the time to it, you can win a lot of Guardian Mirrors. But I will say there's still just a lot of variance. Like, if they hit the Rouse and you draw Zealous Zealous and... You're like, all right, I'm priced into attacking, and you know they block efficiently. Maybe your next turn's bad. Maybe they right. draw the rouse when you have more right. two blocks. Then all of a sudden, it's like it can get dicey. But in general, the variance isn't that high. The variance is like very small, where you lose points here and there, and over the course of like a you know t- 15, 20 turn game or something, right? Then you'll see a difference. But yeah, yeah. cool. So um, theoretically, a little bit favored for Bravo. Assuming, you know, like very slightly, very slightly. I I agree with that. Um, But Victor is the Hyrule King. He pays off the landlords and says, hey, I'm going to win these clashes. So uh, Victor is like one of the most cancerous uh, mirrors that I've ever played in my life. (laughs) So like (laughs) it's really not that fun because of the way that situation starts but like yeah they can just high roll but if they play a normal game you play a normal game which you have to play a normal game because you're playing bravo you're not doing anything inherently broken then uh you should be yeah. you should be okay so yeah yep makes sense okay last deck is the big deck in the format mr zen so just uh mm-hmm. off the back of some bands uh lost bonds of ancestry I almost mm-hmm. forgot the second part of that name. Um, so lost the blues and the yellow. So they still play the reds. It's effectively a majestic at this point. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, there's there's a lot of aspects of this matchup that um, can be hit or miss for a guardian. And we'll let Alan tell you why. Yeah, so I think the matchup is very similar to Katsu in that they have the exponential damage, like you said. Um, like Atsu, if you, you know, let them hit, all of a sudden they're going to trigger links, they're going to uh, ditch a card, Katsu ability combo, and do like triple bonds or something with Art of War or Harmony, right? And so your job is to make sure that doesn't happen, and luckily, like basically every red card in your deck says, give me some cards, or else you're not going to do anything. Like CNC is like less so, but like even minus one card when their deck yeah. wants to be exponential yeah. is very important. So the goal is to just play something threatening every turn. Sink Below is technically not a threatening card, but um, you're you're rarely trying to take every single card from their hand. You're just trying to make them play your game, which is block a little, play a little, block a little, play a little. Because when you're both Mm. doing that, then you maintain advantage. Um, the, the The turn you lose is when you draw all misses, and then you are forced to um, eat whatever they throw at you. And so that all you got is kind of like a iffy card. For example, if you really wanted to be better into um, Zen, you could replace this for the weakest link. That's probably just better. Sure. Um, but then at that point, it's like, okay, I'm running weakest link. Do I run tunic? Do I run a third pummel? Yeah. There's a lot of ways you can go. That's just kind of yeah. there because uh, it's not that bad either. And Zen, if he weapons you, you block two, you get to draw a card. Maybe it's maybe it's pretty good. But yeah. And then hold the line is kind of there because you're generally not swinging your hammer, so you don't really need it to cost three, and when you're paying for an attack, it's fine that it's blue. And on the off chance that you draw this, when they're going off on you, then maybe you survive from the extra yep. two points, right? Yeah, it's all. And then um, you could potentially play Blessing, or not Blessing, um, Balance Adjustments in this yeah, matchup as well to have even extra uh, blocking. So, yeah. Yeah, it's just a, a preference thing. Like, I played Ground of Providence in this style of matchup before as well, just because, like, you need to be able to filter to make sure you get the right cards for your, um, to make sure you keep the ball rolling, right? Like, yeah. It, it's kind of hit or miss on one side or the other. I, I think you do play, like, balance adjusts into, like, the Brutes, for instance, because you know it's guaranteed yes. going to happen because that's, like, their main game plan. But, like, Zen can just, like, kill you without an Art of War. <laughs> so it's like, okay. Yeah. Whatever. Sometimes, uh, 
ninjas will even take out the art of wars um zen probably doesn't do that but i yeah, have but seen that in the past. Example, like, can. yeah Fi has taken that out so it makes balance like literally dead when it comes to the draw card effect right so yeah okay so for zen would you consider this a uh favorite or unfavored matchup i personally have yet to play against the optimized zen list because the last time I played against Zen was like spoiler season when people were testing things out and that was very much not refined. But I think that in a general sense, you should be um, fine. Now, this exact list may not be fine. For example, you can run Weakest Link, you can run Crush the Weak. There's a lot of good cards that can make this deck better into Zen. And right. at that point, right. I assume you should be favored. Um, and arguably, you should probably take this deck towards that direction because Zen is probably still just a large portion of the meta. And even decks that are trying to beat Zen, um, you're kind of favored into. Like, a lot of Riptide's showing up to beat Zen, right? And Riptide's perfectly fine for Bravo, I assume. They got some new toys, but I don't imagine it's completely different. Um, maybe Azalea Armory deck changes something, but I, I doubt it. Aim counter stuff. Sure. Kind of sure. weird. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, or example, like, the dash builds are going away from Pistol. That helps you as a Guardian player. Right. Or uh, Enigma is going more attack action, less ward. Also great for you. So it's right. like... It's interesting because the more decks trend towards beating Zen, the better Guardian will get. But with Zen just receiving bans, it's likely we're going to see a more spread meta, which makes it tough for Guardian to really um, tune for what's expected, right? right? Because if right. it's spread, if it's like there's a good amount of Kano, there's a good amount of Enigma, people play the deck they want to play, then it's like you don't have that true you know, 40 to 60 matchups that you did in previous metas. Mm. Um, so it's like, yeah. And even in a target meta, sometimes Guardian's not good either. But you know, it you can you can find your spots. But um, I would say going into Amsterdam, I don't expect Guardian to really show up unless like it's like retooled quite a large amount, or the meta for some reason is just greatly good for Guardian, which would surprise me. Like, I think New's going to show up a lot. I think Enigma's well, going to show up a lot. We're in a so, more broad meta because of the bans. It's a little bit different yeah. now because we <laughs> went through the national season, bans happened, right? Yeah. And then we've had a little bit of time. People are starting to tune and whatnot. Now, most people know kind of what the Zen looks like nowadays, but does that mean that the majority of the field stay on Zen? Could be yes, could yep. be no. Who knows at this point because we mm -hmm. haven't had a huge event as of late. Um, yep. I mean, there might have been like a battle harden or something. I think there was a battle harden, but yes, mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. I, there was one where it's like, yeah, I, there was a max on Twitter. I saw that that like won it, which was pretty crazy. Oh. Um, I, I think yeah. that's correct, but yeah, yeah. So with that being said, if Max is winning battle hardens, you know the meta is just like kind of all over the place. So um, yeah, in general. Is it a is it a good spot for Guardian? Depending on what you expect and the way you build for the expected mana, answers that question, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, long story short, is Zim favored? Maybe a little bit, depending on how you build the deck. Maybe with this specific list, it's probably close. I. Yeah, you probably have your work cut out for you just because you don't have your two new pummel plays to be able to be like a little bit more efficient on that. But mm -hmm. you do have um, the better disruption than what Victor would have, right? So that that he, is yes. kind of your trade off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like the seven armor won't cover up the crippling, which is really big. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that I've had somebody do that. You know, I play a crippling. Um, they shove their armor, they discard two cards because they like just have a bunch of no blocks because they have transcendent cards and crouching tigers and art of wars in their hand and stuff like that. It's, it's yeah. super good. So uh, 11 is quite a big number. It's very hard to cover up without cards from the hand. So makes sense. Yeah. Okay, Cri well... Crippling Crush truly is is the make or break for Bravo. Like if, the, if Crippling Crush is relevant, then he has a reason to be played. For example, I think in this in last year's nationals um even leading up to worlds icelander was very popular mm. and generally they were on the iron rock gauntlets um sometimes in the past they would play like the one where you pitch to block two iron Hood. but as time passed people started going more towards iron rock just for the block one however with storm shredders tunic and uh, what was the crown called 
the one that you pitch an ice cream. Hornet Peak, I believe. Hornet Peak, yes. Yep. So they have one, two, three, four armor with tunic. If you dominate this crippling, you're like fairly certain it's going to hit. So right. that's like, for example, uh, a meta matchup where this card is very relevant. Now, when KO became the rage, crippling crush technically still is relevant, but very much less so because right. their armor is gigantic. Um, and even if you run into a Levi or something, right? And now KO with bigger armor is tough. Zen, it's interesting because crippling crush technically is still relevant, but dominating it is still very costly. It takes your entire mm -hmm. hand. So you need to eat whatever they throw at you. And the more you eat, like throwing back and forth, then the less big their combo turn needs to be. So if you have just like a middling turn, they can just be like, okay, I'm pretty sure I can do like 25 right here and you're dead if you're like both at 15, 15. So the hard part is that you kind of need to keep it all the way until they're dead. <laughs> yep. Nope. Makes sense. And that kind of leads into uh, our last segment before we wrap up the episode is how do you beat Bravo? Okay. Yeah. Like, like you said, like if we're in a meta where crippling crush isn't as relevant, it makes sense. You know, like it's pretty easy to beat a Bravo if they can't hit you with the crippling crush, right? So I, that's yeah. just one aspect. But let's think of in a broader term, like what kind of strategy if you were to play a deck that is traditionally unfavored into Guardian or Bravo, how would mm -hmm. you suggest for that person who, let's say it's a Riptide or it's a Dory or something along those lines, how do they need to build their deck? in a sideboard sense to be able to beat us as Bravo players? I think a lot of it has to do with, when, at least when it comes to decks with unfavored matchups into Bravo or Guardian, I think a lot of it has to do with expectations, for example. So, for example, let's talk about Riptide. The big thing that everyone talks about is that Riptide is just fatigable, right? If I just block and swing hammer every turn, I'm going to beat you. So, for example, against that strategy, you can try the Riptide that runs, you know, triple remembrance, big arrows, and you're like, actually, mm -hmm. I did the math. If you only block, I do kill you. Um, so then maybe the Bravo starts to attack back and forth a little bit. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, but I also have D-Reacts to cover up when you try to attack or dominate me back. So it's weird. Um, Riptide, I think, is a hard one because there's a, he's... He's very good at targeting certain decks, and by trying to beat Bravo, you kind of dilute your strategy into other decks. So that's tough. As for Azalea, this one's probably more relevant. Yep. For example, the argument is either you can run D Reacts to sort of uh, catch Bravo off guard, because generally when I play against Azalea, I always assume, or I almost always assume they don't have a D React. They're constantly cycling through their arsenal. Uh, so Generally, against other decks, you can kind of guess when they have a D-React, when you haven't played anything too threatening for a while, and they're kind of sitting on it a little bit. Um, you can kind of feel it out. But as for Azalea, they're constantly cycling through their arsenal, so you never really know what to expect. So you kind of just go. And so as Azalea, if you stop the Crippling out of nowhere and you don't, and Bravo doesn't get the on-hit, all of a sudden, you know, Bravo's super behind. Because then to dominate that Crippling, he needed to keep a bunch of cards. Or even the Starstruck, same situation. You basically, if you're running D-Reacts, you need to catch them at a point where they commit cards to dominate and punish them for that. Because if they don't hit their crush, then the dominate is just wasted resources slash value uh, that they could have blocked with, for example. Conversely, the other strategy to beat Bravo is to just go, uh, like, full... Full unga bunga, full attack, no D reacts, no nothing. You don't dilute your deck at all. And you basically say, okay, you can keep hitting me. I'm going to try my best to stay alive and play efficient attacks. But if you ever miss, I'm going to hit you so hard that you're probably not going to be able to keep as many cards to keep hitting me. That's the other right. strategy. And right. some decks do this better than others. For example, Lexi at her peak with Bullseye Bracers and Snap was actually insane because you hit this crippling they discard some cards they go you know tunic three of a kind and all of a sudden they still hit you for like 15 right um but even azalea for azalea following this strategy is a little tougher uh zen i would say does this strategy pretty well because he also has the armor to help mitigate a turn where he wants to go for it like if it's any attack other than crippling you just shove seven and you get your big hand and you can kill them um sure. because the the last part about this strategy where you just you don't respect the crush and you just try to stay alive and threaten a little bit is that um, the best example of this was like Phi, for example. Um, 
Fi had a lot of like one card fours and a decent amount of cards that block three. You could run mm -hmm. sync if you wanted to, but generally the idea was that even if Bravo is dominating me or playing disruptive on hits, I can just block as much as I can and throw four. And that's still getting me my, you know, close to 13, 14 value if I just block and attack for four. Um, I guess that's uh, that's 13, right? And right. so generally Bravo is never pushing that much higher than, you know, 12, 13 a turn. But on the turn where they whiff, they're much lower than that, which makes it awkward for them. Like if you if if you just block, maybe you full block and you play nothing and they draw four blues, all of a sudden they they strand a bunch of cards and you get to come in for your deck that's a little more consistent on the damage aggressive side. Right. So there's that aspect to it as well. But in general, I would say in the current meta, a lot of decks already have a good time into Bravo. Um, you don't have to worry too much. And so for the decks that don't have a favorite matchup into Bravo, I would say don't worry because you're probably not going to run into him anyways. Um, but yeah. No, these are all fair points. All fair points. And um, yeah, I, I think the Azalea example is a is a great one because different way, like you don't play around the D-Reacts. And then if they do play like a hyper-aggressive style plan, they can still just kind of get you because they are so... Um, they're really fine too yeah, now. They'll, sure. they'll like, yeah. they'll play like an amplifying euro for like twenty, and it's just like, where did this come from? This is crazy. Yeah. You know, like there's there's a lot of cool stuff. And then uh, obviously, Codex has been a busted card since it yeah. came out, right? So if mm -hmm. you are caught with your pants down without uh, having an arsenal, or you crown off of like an attack, they snaps and then they Codex you, and then they make you discard the card. That's also a disaster. So there's just like little tricks that you can do against Bravo, even if it's a quote unquote, a favored matchup that will gain you a lot of percentage points and probably push you to the point where you can uh, kind of close out the game. The big thing with Bravo is like, he has to have a life total um, kind of like threshold right to be able to take some damage to send disruption back and then kind of chain that disruption a little bit in the mid game yeah. to kind of close out the game if you get him low enough he's never casting a crippling crush again so you never have to worry about a card like that right so that's just one mm -hmm. of the downsides of these like really big um like high costing cards is that it takes a lot of resource to do so right so if you can just knock bravo off of that leg to where he can't do that it's it's pretty I don't want to say it's easy, but it's like way better than it would have been. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of just kind of to reiterate what you said. Okay. Well, this was a lot of information and I appreciate <laughs> yeah. you giving all of this information. I had a great time. I love talking yeah, Bravo. I'm... I could talk Bravo for hours, man. Bravo is yeah, my dude. I think there's like, there, there, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff we could definitely dive into, but you know, I think you could do that with a lot of decks and we've both played Bravo a lot. So we have a lot to say. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap up the video real quick here. So uh, I'm going to thank our sponsors. So we have fabric.gg for all your ratio needs. Go over there, see what people are playing. Use that tool all the time. And they have articles. One of my locals is writing articles for fabric.gg. And that is Joe O'Brien. Uh, love Joe. Great player. And uh, does a lot of like cool kind of casually tailored content too. Like if you're trying to play some like neat little angles and blitz or something like that, there's, there's a lot of variety there. Okay. And then, uh, Magnolia games is our card shop sponsor they are doing pre-orders on Rosetta right now. So if you guys want to go ahead and do that use our affiliate link below, you can get Rosetta and guarantee that you're going to get your boxes on release day. Okay. And then dragon shield, everybody knows dragon shield at this point for all your card protection needs. Obviously, I use them exclusively, but I've used them exclusively for a decade, right? Great stuff. Never have issues with Dragon Shield. Check them out. You won't be disappointed. Now, Alan, obviously, we're going to shout you out for being the expert on Bravo. <laughs> and uh, always a pleasure. I love watching your videos. You're always very well articulated, and I love that. And there's a lot of back and forth that we've had in this video, which I can appreciate as well. Do you have any shout outs that you would like to reference at this time? I would just like to shout out, like, for example, my team, like Team Scroop Waffle. I think mm -hmm. a big reason why I'm even able to like be the player that I am today is because of all the friends I've made through that team. Like Oliver kicks my ass on Illusionist since yeah. I started playing this game. And it got so bad to the point where Part of my identity is building a guardian deck that can be illusionist and when Fair. that is not possible it makes me sad which is right now but yeah. um or yuki for example she kicks my axe my, or she kicked my axe on 
on Lexi way back. And that helped me beat other Lexis because I was like, I don't know what it is, but just like she could just find those extra points of a deck that was already super strong. Right. So, uh, but yeah, all the guys on all the guys and girls on that team have helped my journey as a player a lot. And, you know, I don't spend that much time as I would like playing Fab if I really wanted to compete. But, you know, putting in the time where I can and just enjoying the tournament scene that I can show up at is just it's just a great time. So, right. Well, good. Yeah, again, love your content. I think you come at it at a, a very approachable way when it comes to your Bravo mm -hmm. content. Um, you go through and you kind of like give different kind of terminology and whatnot that kind of helps understand the fundamentals of playing Bravo. You know, like having your surge generators, for example, you say that a lot in your videos mm -hmm. and your, um, you know, your surge absorbers, I'm going to say for, because uh, I can't, something like that, yeah, 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 your payoff, right? So like, you know, your generator would be a command and conquer with your tech plating and then your uh, payoff would be your three card crippling. Like there's a lot of things that you do in those videos. And I think that's great. So again, we're going to uh, reference Alan in the comments below or not the comments the description below so you can go check him out and uh give him some support you know gets plenty of views you, you get thousands of views <laughs> anyway so you're doing great man i haven't posted a video in a while and it's all relevant to, still just, yeah the time the time is just is tough right now but when rosetta i'm i am pretty excited for rosetta because i do love i do love tales as a set and just the whole elemental talent system as a whole like i think lexi oldham and briar were all very cool and you know People hated them at different times of the meta, but I'm excited to see what they do next with them. And I'm not really a Runeblade or a Wizard player, but, you know, I'm, I might give it a shot if if Guardian doesn't, you know, feel like it's... Sure, uh, sure. It's just, it's just tough putting down Bravo. I'm probably going to try out for Dance. She looks really cool, like with the yeah. light game style Wizard. That's mm -hmm. what I expect to happen. We're going we're gonna to learn about who the Wizards are very soon, like tomorrow, I believe. Now, I'm timestamping oh. the video technically, but... Oh, okay yeah yeah gotcha. we're gonna we're gonna see what their hero yeah, text yeah. is and that's gonna be cool do you plan on going yeah, to tampa for the uh for the world premiere so i could but yeah. it's a question of should i <laughs> which i don't know uh, yet. that that's um, fair it's a little closer for me i can drive there so yeah so it's it's a bit of a flight uh it's not too bad like it's still domestic it's not like a commitment like worlds right right um but we'll see i I do think Tampa would be really fun just because I have taken a break from like CC and like sure. really competing. Like I'll still show up to age, but like the last age was draft. So I like didn't really have to do any prep for that. But um, right. I mean, technically I should have prepped for it, but like it is draft, you know, you can just give it a try and see how it goes. I was just having a good time. But yeah, same same reason for Tampa. It's like, you know, it's a new set. Everyone's basically on the same playing field. Like some, sure, some people will like dissect all the spoilers. Maybe they'll even print it out or something to like really go at it. But sure. in general, just going to have a good time. It does sound very enticing. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, if you're there, good luck. If you're not, wish me luck. Thank you. I'll see you there. Good luck to you. Good luck to or, you. Or whatever. You know, we'll, we'll keep in we'll touch, keep obviously. To, uh, see you in top eight. And then I could be like, ah, oh, look, a Guardian player made top eight in the That's Rune right. Wizard set. <laughs> that's right that's right that's cool man all right Just well again yeah yeah uh, exactly again thank you for being my expert guest on uh this episode of fab a to z with the card guys and uh again you've been great we'll see you guys next time bye, -bye.